everyone, and you're very welcome to the planning meeting, uh, and welcome to those that are joining us online as well. Uh, can I just ask any uh, planning committee members online to keep their cameras on during the meeting? And first of all, we'll take any apologies. Chair, Mary here, I've lost myself, there we go. Um, Chair, go ahead, can I, thank you. Um, can I have an apology for Councillor John Coyle, can't make it today. Okay, um, there now. Thanks, Mary. Chair. John. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Robert Irvine is unavailable today as well. Okay, thanks, John. And Tommy? Uh, Tom, Councillor uh, Glenn Campbell hopes to join us at 2.30. Okay, thank you for that. No other apologies then. We'll go on to sign the minutes and confidential minutes of the planning committee on the 19th of October and the reconvened planning committee meeting held on the 26th of October. The minutes of the planning meeting held on the 16th of November. So, first of all, we'll take Wednesday, 19th of October, and page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. Could I have a vote? I don't need them. Don't need them. Just pass right. Okay, matters arising. Page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, four, twelve, right? I was just doing the moderation now. That's good. Yeah, am I right? I took the correct receiver. That would explain that. All right. So we are. We have uh, gone through them for my apologies, guys. I were taking them for accuracy and matters arising. So we have uh, done the matters arising on the set of minutes, which is Wednesday, 19th of October. So there's no matters arising out of them. We are now going on when the chair catches up with where he should be, is we're going to do Wednesday, the 19th of October's minutes, and we're going to do them for matters arising. I have a, they are the, the confidential ones. Okay. And the, the 26th of October then is the reconvened planning meeting. So we'll try these for uh, matters arising then. Uh, page one, page two, page three, page four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. No matters rising there. Sure. Just, just for accuracy and 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 assist me as well. Is that the the 
to reconvene. When was that, Peter? That's several days have been cut out. 19th of November, okay. Apologies for that. Well, I'm, yeah, I haven't got to them yet. I'm down as chair in it anyway. Uh, I see that, that was the correction. Sorry, Chair. Okay. So let's keep. Okay, and we're going to do the planning committee meeting minutes then for matters arising on Wednesday, the 16th of November. And page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. Okay, thank you members for that. Is there any declaration of interest? Not seeing any, so thank you. And so we're going to move on then to our files. And so application one, LA 10 2022 0945, extension of existing vehicle parking road and inclusion of picnic areas. Sorry. Okay, good afternoon, members. So, uh, first application today is application number one, LA 10 2022 945. It's a full application of the extension of existing vehicle parking uh, and road and inclusion of picnic areas. Um, the applicant then is the council, and the location then is at the uh, Loch Navarre Forest Park. <coughs> Excuse me, the recommendation then is to approve planning permission for the reasons within the report and subject to the one condition. I'll just take members through the, the details then on the screen then. So you can see the public road then is the, the line down in the bottom right. Um, and then you have the, the private laneway that comes off up into the, towards the viewpoint and allows access up into that, that area of the forest the park. There are two car parks identified on the map. You can see car park one, uh, which is over where the yellow star is. And then car park two, which is in the top left of the slide, uh, where the second star is. Uh, so the application is at both those sites, car park one and car park two. So we take the first one. Um, this is the existing road layout on the right hand side of the slide. So you can see the road bends around the corner and there's a lay by them with informal parking along it. The proposal then on the left hand side is to realign the road slightly. So we'll take the bend away and the inside slightly to allow the car parking on the left hand side of the road. Uh, there will be 10 spaces for cars, uh, minibus space and, and two picnic tables in the central area. And uh, that'll allow then the cars to be parked in off the road with the vehicles allowed to travel on up through and past. The second car park area then that's being worked at is uh, further on up the road. And you can see in the bottom slide, the aerial image shows the existing situation. So you come in off the road and there's a uh, room there for cars to park. Proposal then is to change that um, and create 12 car parking spaces by extending the uh, sort of the tarmac area of parking. There'll be two timber um, picnic tables and the minibus space then will be provided as well. So overall members, you'll note the recommendation is to approve planning commission for the reasons listed in the report. 
and subject to the one condition. And just to provide members an update at the time of writing the report, there was no reply from DFI Roads. They have now replied uh, and are content that there's no road safety or pedestrian safety issues for them. Uh, so there's no impact and no concerns from them. So the recommendation is to approve as per the report uh, and subject to that one condition. Okay. Thank you very much, Darren. Members, Anthony. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And yeah, happy to propose the recommendation. That would be a, a good boost up there at the viewpoint, there, on the way up to the viewpoint, them two extra car parks. And I know it's going to leave one of them safer where that bend is there for. I'd be up there fully off myself. And it'd be a good boost for the area. So we're happy to propose. Thank you. Well, I'll second that. Just Chair. Yeah. Chair, second. Car park. Basically, this. Is there an answer along the front of that? That goes along the front of it. Uh, um, it would be difficulties with uh, allowing cars in if there was a fence. So the front of it would have to be you know, maintained as open space. But it's a sort of dead end entrance there. It's not a, or a through road to anywhere. The traffic seems to go up the other way. No, no, with your park, you would be up and down over there. No, well, there's no no, no fence proposed. No, I think one time they, put, they pushed a the car down over that and set her on fire. I'm sure. Yeah. Is that up at the top? Don't know. Sorry. In the wrong spot. <laughs> right, okay. Get on. Okay. Cheers, spot. Okay. We have it proposed and seconded, members, and there's nobody else indicating. So are we all agreed? Okay. Current. Okay, members. So the application LA 10 2022 recommendation was to approve. Members have granted approval subject to that condition. Okay. We're moving on now. We're going to move to item number six and to consider the three delegated files for calling. Uh, that have been called in for decision by the planning committee. And uh, we have the first one is LA 10 2021-0257. And we have uh, with us Mr. Paul Bradley, who is the agent online. Paul, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Fine, yeah. Lovely, thank you. And Darren. Okay, members. So, paper B, uh, application number one, LA10 2021 0257. It's a full application for a housing development uh, of 34 dwellings, consisting of a detached five townhouses and 28 semi detached houses, a new site road, uh, and associated site works. The applicant then is DBN Limited, and the location then is uh, in Lock Macquarie. So, it's land immediately east, south, and west of 151 Lock Macquarie Road. The recommendation is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the five reasons. Members, just take through the details then. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the layout of Lock Macquarie, but that, just to show you where we are. So you're, um, there's an aerial image then on the screen showing the three fields that are subject to this application site. And you can see them on the left there, identified by the yellow star. Just to zoom in a bit closer then. So on the right-hand side is the aerial image looking down on top of the, the fields. Um, you can see the three of them identified by the yellow star on the right-hand side in the aerial photograph. And on the left then, it's just a, a site location map showing their location. So you can see the context of the site in relation to other buildings uh, and houses uh, in the immediate area. So the home area plan, uh, the three fields are included within the settlement limit of Lock Macquarie. And you can see that's the, the plan then, the home area plan on the screen for the whole of the village. If you just zoom in then a bit closer, you can see the settlement limit runs along the bottom of the, the two fields and then along the left-hand side of the two fields on the left of the the, the, um, the stars. The Everything on the right-hand side and inside that is inside the settlement limit. Everything on the other side is outside the settlement limit. So you're immediately adjacent to the edge of the limit. Um, and as you approach in from the countryside into the, the village, it's a, an important field. For, for the setting of the village. Uh, I'll come on to that in a second. So the views in, these are Google Street View images looking towards the, the application site. Um, on the slide, you can see the red line uh, and then there's a fence above that. Our site is just beyond that fence, so it's on the other side of the, the red line. The field where the red line is in, that sort of rushy field that we're looking at in front of you, is the cutty side. 
and the red line then defines, or that wooden fence defines the settlement limit, the edge of the limit along that location as you approach into the village. Moving on closer to the site then and looking in, you can see the, the view in towards the uh, front road frontage field. Uh, and then the application site, the L shape of it goes into the back and then round the farm buildings then, and then the L shape is the same round to the left. So that boundary, the wooden post fence, you can see there along the right hand side, that's the critical boundary at the edge of the settlement limit. The applicant, uh, it's a full application, so it is accompanied by various plans setting out the details of the application. And so drawing all three on the screen then shows the concept plan. Uh, and this is the start of the design process where the developer will We'll set out the format and the layout for the proposed site. So you can see the entrance coming in off the road and then the blue line shows the estate roadway with the houses then aligned around the estate. That then transposes into the block plan uh, and you can see then on the screen the uh, proposed block plan. Uh, again, remember the red lines on the left and the bottom of the slide are the settlement limit uh, and you can see everything is inside the limit. So just take that, just that block plan there. I'll take in some detail members just to let you see it. And so the red line along the top of the slide is the public road. We'll then come off the public road uh, into the black arrows. Uh, so it'll come in and then it'll be a, a, a 90 degree bend and then another one in and then on further in to allow the, the development to be opened up and developed. The area immediately beside the road will be an area of open space and that's going to be the yellow star. Uh, and you can see that um, identified on the plan. There then are three pairs of semis. The semis closest to the road uh, will be split so the front of one of the houses will face on the public road and uh, sort of a gable approach then to the side and the other one then is at 90 degree to that so it'll face into the, the development so if we move on south you can see those three buildings moving on below those you come along around the corner and the rest of the development is there as it says an l-shaped development so the red squares really are rectangles are the shapes of the houses and you can see the semis aligned along the road with the detached house then in the corner plot and the townhouses then at the end um, of the development with the parking then at the front of them. There'll also be then an area of open space in front of the four townhouses at the end of the development. You can see the two yellow stars, so that'll be an area of public open space uh, with, with the estate road then the turning head at the end of it. The houses then, you can, uh, that's the townhouses at the top of the slide and the uh, semi-detached and detached houses then are on the screen. Uh, you can see those in uh, the front elevations have put those up, members. A uh, critical issue here will be the orientation of the houses. So the slide in the bottom right, the image in the bottom right, shows the rear elevation of the semi-detached houses. That's the view you will see on the uh, approach into the village because the backs of the houses face in that direction. The front of the houses then will face in towards the site. Um, so you'll note from the report members of various issues uh, that are material to the application and one of those is the proximity to the nearby farms. There are two farms in question and both of those are outside of the control of the applicant so they're in third party ownership. So you have the three fields with the yellow star and then you have the red uh, stars which is uh, across the road and immediately beside the site. The application is accompanied by information on those farms and those businesses and does assess the impact from noise and odour. Uh, and includes uh, this plan, which is helpfully attached with the drawing, with the application. Um, so you can see the, the top of the slide there, if I start off, you have the two sheep pens across the road, uh, along with the fodder storage. Uh, moving then into or the cattle pen as well, then on that side of the road as well. Moving in, um, you can see there's a machinery store, you have farm middens, you have a cattle shed, and then a calf shed. So two active farms. Uh, with a lot of animals um, in and out. And as I say, the agent has and the applicant has provided information on the impacts from those farms, from odours and noise, and they're included within the, the public information. So if you take the farm beside the, immediately beside the site, you can see the red stars enter the buildings uh, that have been identified on the, the farm business. Um, these then have been measured uh, and their uses uh, explored by the applicant and mitigation is proposed. The mitigation, the first instance, is a two metre high earth bond with uh, a landscaping and trees on top of it, along with a 1.8 metre high fence along the inside. And that will run along the line of the, the red line shown in the slide in front of you. Those will be um, mitigation in terms of the visual impact. Uh, in other words, they're trying to screen the site uh, and noise as well from the bond and the fence. 
The odour concentrations then have also been assessed and measured by the applicant. Uh, the red line then is identified by the applicant as um, being of moderate offensive. And you can see in the top right of the slide, there's a table one, which is the odour benchmark levels. Uh, under moderately offensive odours, uh, life, intensive livestock rearing uh, has a benchmark level of three. So the uh, information provided by the applicant is that the line of that three, of that benchmark three, is running along that red line. Uh, so you can see the proximity then of the farm buildings to the houses, and the houses then are outside of that uh, moderately offensive odour line. And I'm sure the agent will want to come on to that further in his speaking rights. In terms of separation distances from the farm buildings, and this has been in relation to odours and noise, the you can see then just a few of the separation distances. So at the top of the slide is about 40 metres between the buildings. You're moving down then 22, approximately 22, 25 and 36. And that would be to the nearest part of the buildings. Um, so again, remember, it's just that red line, that odour line uh, is to be established by an evergreen hedgerow. Uh, and that will... Uh, identify the edge of the odour prediction line. Uh, again, that will act as a screening for visual as well, so it will, but it will also identify the, the distances. So you'll note also, members from the report, there's an issue in relation to the footpath length that's proposed. Normally, the footpath length would come down the entrance into an estate and be along the edge of the public road. In this case, that's not uh, uh, proposed. And what is proposed is at the end of the development, there'll be a new footpath link created down along the side of an existing housing development uh, and out then onto the public road to join into the existing infrastructure. So you can see the yellow line then is the boundary of the adjacent houses and the adjacent housing estate and the red line then is the new footpath link and it'll run down from the estate road down along the back of those properties and out onto the public road where it'll join in at the red star. So that will connect into the public infrastructure. The issue that roads are saying is that there needs to be a footpath link from the front of the development uh, and planning officers would agree and would, would, would share that view. Um, that, uh, the houses at the road frontage and that side of the development, there needs to be a footpath link from the estate entrance down along the edge of the road. So from the yellow star from our site along the road edge there, as you can see, down to that blue house at the bottom, there needs to be a footpath link. Now, obviously, the applicant hasn't, isn't proposing that um, and is proposing this alternative means of access. Um, also within the report members of the footpath link then uh, along the back of the existing properties it'll run down parallel with that fence uh, and you can see the height and the size of that fence uh, and uh, how there's, there's views over the top of that into the rear private immediate areas of those houses uh, though there is some mitigation proposed um, the footpath link along the edge of that boundary will allow people just to look uh, over the top of those fences into the private areas of those properties Uh, again, members, that's just a, an image of the site frontage. Um, so, say finally, members, the, the, the other issue then for planning officers is the setting of the village. It's an important issue. Uh, as you come into the, the uh, village, then this is going to be a key site. The orientation of the houses then are back on to the those views, um, and uh, they don't present a, an attractive viewpoint on that approach. There's also meant to be an established buffer along the edge of a, of a settlement limit. We normally, planning guidance would say there has to be a landscape buffer along there. Um, but again, that's something that can be looked at uh, in, in any design issues. At the moment, there's no landscaping proposed. The what's there will be retained uh, and possibly augmented, but the backs of those houses will face onto the road. So you'll note from the report, then, members, the various issues and the reasons for refusal. There's essentially three reasons, three broad reasons, members. So you the design and appearance, uh, and that it fails to create a quality and sustainable residential development. Uh, it doesn't respect its surrounding context. Um, and then it's of a density higher to that found in the established residential area. As I said, it's, it's on the exit out of the village, so there should be a reduction in the density. The footpath link then is the second issue. Um, there's no link along the front of the site to the existing infrastructure, and then it will um, impact upon existing residents from overlooking loss of immunity. And then finally, the issue about the uh, farming activities and the impact that'll have upon the existing, uh, upon the proposed houses. Not only that, then the impact that the proposed houses would have upon the existing businesses uh, and the likelihood that it would give rise to complaints. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Saren. And we have uh, Paul now. Uh, you have your 10 minutes, so. Yes. Am I ready to go, yeah? Let's work away. Okay. Um, firstly, thank you to the committee for calling on this application for consideration. Um, the refusal recommendations for this application can be broken down in three main sections, and as Darren has just pointed out. The site layout, scale, massing, and overall density. A footpath link provision, which has been provided, and the suggestion of a conflict with adjoining land uses, namely the adjoining farms. On the first section, the planner report presented to the committee states on three occasions that this application is for 34 houses, yet the most recent submission it being considered by the planning office is for 26 houses, and this has been uploaded on the portal. This has been reduced since February 2022 to facilitate roads comments, improve distances and screening from the adjoining farm and addresses comments from the Environmental Health Department. The report then goes on to explain how elements of the design layout is unacceptable. However, the final layout can be agreed with the planning officers should this proceed. There appears to be more emphasis on the density of our proposed development when compared to existing densities of the uh, housing in the area. For total clarity on this, the two nearest housing developments within the Lock McCrory area are Drummond Lane. This has a density of 10.5 houses per acre. Then there's Barrick Hill Meadows, which is also at the edge of a settlement limit in Lock McCrory, and it has a density of 8.25 houses per acre. The density of our proposal based on 26 houses is eight houses per acre. So this is actually lower than surrounding housing developments in terms of density. On that basis, it would appear that the scale, mass and overall density of our proposal is sympathetic with the Lock and Crown area, despite what has been presented in the report to this committee. The second issue is the provision of a suitable footpath link for the development. Within the planning report, there are repeated comments of a footpath link being provided and other comments that is not sufficient and not provided. For the avoidance of doubt, there is a footpath link being provided, as Darren just explained, and it does link up with the existing footpath network to the front of Drummond Lane to the east of the site. If you look at the layout, it shows very clearly that our site flows from east west to east, with the exception of possibly the front two houses. The remainder of the houses would naturally walk towards the east to get to local facilities. And in that case, it would be following the footpath link that is clearly provided throughout our site. And this, we could provide screening either side of the footpath where it goes down past the existing houses and the farm. And this would address overlooking. One of the main reasons the footpath link is not provided along the Lock McCrory Road frontage is due to the fact that there is a working farm along the frontage. It would be against all health and safety guidance to try to encourage residents to walk along the road frontage where machinery may well be operating. Prior to this application being presented to the council, we actually had a discussion with the planning department about foot pro path provision alternative to what, and as we've suggested. They actually stated that council would prefer development of the settlement lands to take place with a safe footpath then no development happening on the site at all within the settlement limit. Concerns about the timing of the footpath provision can be conditioned prior to occupation. This development has been designed to provide a suitable safe footpath for the residents to access local facilities as part of the design concept. And we've deliberately not taken a footpath along the Lock and Curry Road, and this would be unsafe to do so. The third section of the refusal recommendations suggest a conflict with adjoining land uses, namely the adjoining farm due to noise and odour issues and respecting their farm activity. This site is located within the settled limit within a rural village and is typical with all rural villages where there will be farm activity within the surrounding areas. While the adjoining farm has raised concerns around our development, the current layout has addressed these concerns and there's adequate separation and screening away from the farm and this will protect both his activities and the possible occupants of any housing. Any rural dweller will know that odour from a farm building is generally within 25-30 metres of the building. Beyond this, the odour does disperse. Local knowledge suggests the existing housing in the area have had no issues with noise or odour at this location. Environmental Health have provided comments throughout the application. They have not said that this application should be refused, as they normally would when they rule out any proposal 
but they specifically state they cannot support the application. Our applicant engaged a third party noise and odor consultant who has provided a methodology for mitigation of odors and noise. Within the site layout, we have added the odor concentration prediction zone, which Darren has pointed out, and for the surrounding farms, and this was the basis for the reduction in houses from 34 down to now 26, to ensure that no dwelling or garden space would be within the zone for moderately offensive odour. In addition to this, all proposed houses are downwind of the proposed farms, and for the majority of the year, any odours would be blown away from our proposed housing. Environmental Health has suggested a separation distance of 75 metres from the farm buildings, and if this was applied, then none of the proposed housing would be erected. However, and possibly more importantly, this would also mean that 17 of the existing houses within the surrounding Dramanand Lane should not be there, and they are upwind of the farm. They have existed without any issues for around 20 years. The same Environmental Health Department and planning policies were in existence at the time that development was approved. There are none of our proposed houses any closer to the farm buildings than the existing buildings within Draman and Lane. And the same principle should apply with our proposal. And at the end of the day, in the interest of fairness, and this is also fully supported by a consultant's report. The plan report very clearly states in page 8 that it is important to note that there is no planning policy that refers to or requires a 75 metre separation distance. This is non-planning guidance. If this was planning policy, then under PPS 21 with dwellings on farms, there would be very few new dwellings permitted in farms, as that policy asks for houses to be grouped with farm buildings. So the 75 metre suggestion is at odds with actual planning policy for dwellings on farms. We also have an identical or very similar application for housing adjacent to a farm in the Mid Ulster District Council planning area. In the same approach, methodology, separation distances have been provided. The application has been brought to the next committee meeting with recommendation to approve the application. And in this circumstance, Environmental Health have provided a condition to be added to the approval as follows. Should planning be of a mind to approve the proposed, the occupants of the proposed must be made aware that they may suffer loss of amenity on occasion from noise, dust, odour and potentially vermin on occasion as a result of being located in close proximity to a working farm, which could also be added in this case. It is quite clear that the suggestion of odour and noise nuisance has been addressed, and based on the mitigations and distances proposed, this application should be approved on the basis of the information proposed and in fairness to the existing surrounding approvals and houses and the approach other councils in use in making sound planning decisions. In summary, while there may be some final tweaking to be carried out to the finer details of the site layout, the main consideration for the committee is that the noise and odour issues around the farm have been successfully addressed using the methodology suggested and accepted by other councils. Remember, there is no actual planning guidance or policies on separation distances. We have had discussion with the planning officers and the concerns about density and layouts can be addressed should the committee be content with the overall principle of housing adjacent to this existing farm. I would respectfully request that a general recommendation to approve this is proposed subject to final amendments being agreed with the planning office. Thank you for your time. Paul, can you hear us? Yeah. Hello, Paul. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you just confirm on your screen there, it's coming up, Aidan Begley. Oh, I've uh, made, made Aidan's business partners and he's up at the next meeting. He's at the next. That's all right, Paul. I just wanted to check that we had the, the right person on oh, the, no. <laughs> the, the screen for no problem. just the record purposes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation there. Thank Have you. we any questions, members? Josephine. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Darren, for your presentation, and thanks, Mr. Bradley, for uh, coming and addressing 
the committee. I just wondered, Mr Bradley, if you had any comment to make regarding the, the fact that the, the rear of the houses face out when you're driving along the approach uh, road. Are there any mitigations that you would propose to shield the rear of the houses uh, from public view? Thank you. Paul? Yes, um, on this matter, we have no issues. We can provide additional screening. And it has previously been suggested by the planning office that we could tweak the layout to adjust that view and, and all the rest. But I would also point out that if anyone knows the approach from the south into Lock and Crory, I previously mentioned Barrick Hill Meadows. The exact same situation occurs there on a previous approval. We are arriving at the village looking into the back of the houses. We provided four metre buffer of planting along there, and that was perfectly acceptable at the time. Okay. Thank you. Barry? Yeah. I have to say it was an excellent presentation from Mr. Bradley, and I don't say that lightly, you know, the way he approached it, the way he addressed each of the issues. My question uh, to Mr. Bradley would be a bit like Josephine's, but on another aspect, it would be to seek reassurance that with that footpath link that is being established, that the amenity of the the single dwelling where the people are concerned there about um, views, you know, into their housing environment, you know, into their space, upsetting maybe their pleasantness of place. But you have mitigations in place for that, as I understand. And no, I think that is, is, is one of those people looking for, looking for things in place, either a heightened fencing or something like that. Yes, on this, we had proposed some planting that, um, uh, that's house number two. They have actually suggested we erect a two metre screen wall up along the rear. I've spoke to my applicant and there's no issues with doing that. And again, I think if we can overcome the overall issues about noise and order around this farm, the planning office is willing to work with us to get an approved layout. And we can tweak all them things and address that, no problem. Thank you. Okay. Alan. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Paul. Uh, perhaps my question uh, relates to the farmyard. It looks very peculiar situation to me, where a farmyard would be sitting in the midst of a working farmyard, uh, all stock and all, all. Uh, feed and everything would have to come from uh from uh, well maybe not a long distance but to to that is is this an intensive work on farm i.e beef cattle uh certainly would hardly be dairy uh but uh, uh, the officers here the plant officers uh sketch did show that that was mixed farming and I wondered what scale of farming does happen there. Okay, thanks, Alan. Paul? Yeah, well, um, the, the, the person that owns the farm has actually wrote in a representation letter to suggest that it is cattle farming that he does, so there's no dairy farming takes place. But I would point out, and I think Darren showed it on his aerial image, the, the farm building is actually closest to our development, do not contain any animals. One is a machinery shed and one is for haylage. The actual um, beef cattle and all the rest are actually the buildings that are closest to Drummond Lane. So it's actually Drummond Lane that would be more affected by this farm than our proposal, especially bearing in mind that it is upwind of the farm and we're downwind. Okay. That's as I read it as well, and thank you for that clarification. Thank okay. you. Okay, no problem. Anthony? Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Paul, for that, and thanks to Darren before that for the presentation. Then Darren referred to that field beside it. There's a rushy field. If he was living in Garrison, he wouldn't call that a rushy field. There wasn't very little rushes on it. Well, anyway, but I, I've just told, I live on a, on a working farm myself, 
and when I'm at the meeting at the ministers beside our sheds here so I, I kind of can relate to what we're talking about here but the the houses that is already there on the other side of the proposed site is closer to the farm and I see on page three there that says there's no noise or odor has been many objections from them houses through the years and maybe, maybe Darren might know this better I could be asked the wrong man was them houses built you know was the sheds there before the house was built you know what was was that's what I'm kind of coming at here. You know, that the sheds, I say them sheds was there before them houses was, was built, and there wasn't a problem that time. You know, so I couldn't really see it being that big of a problem from the farm there. And you just have good open spaces there between them, and it's going to be a pile of of of, of clay built up and a fence on top of that. You know, Anthony, so. Anthony, can I encourage just questions here? Yes. Yes. Can I oh, encourage yeah. okay. questions from members yeah. rather than than oh. than comments here? Okay, sorry, 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 Thomas. Well, the question would be: Was was them house built on the far side before the sheds? Which was first? Maybe not. Okay, exactly. I I can, I can answer that if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. I, I have actually checked before this meeting aerial imagery from uh, circa two thousand and three to two thousand and seven, and them build the houses were just being erected at that time. The farm was fully established, and all the buildings that are currently there are on the aerial images. And only the first, I think, eight houses had been erected at that time. Okay, thank you, uh, John. Thank you, uh, Chair. My question is related again to the farmyard. Um, as a child growing up, obviously, I, I lived on a farm, and I wouldn't have been a great child. There's plenty of things to get into on farms. It, it's what the security of the farmyard. Considering these, this is a new development, so you're anticipating new families moving in there, young children growing up, and and we know that children can get into. We've seen tragedies all over the world, and one particularly in the UK yeah, over the weekend, where children can get into into Hollands and far, and a farmyard is a dangerous place, and, and it would be the security of the farmyard. These houses, the other ones back onto it. But these ones here are actually looking into the farmyard, so they're looking out of their doors into the farmyard, even with screening. It's still going to be there. They're going to be walking past it, so it would be the security of the farmyard to protect the young families and as the children grow up and explore. Paul? Well, uh, specifically on that, um, on the older concentration area where we've suggested no development will take place in that, we're providing secure fencing and um, screen hedging along there. And specifically on the footpath link, that is why we have took it over to the very eastern side of the farm to keep anybody that wants to go up and down to the local facilities away from the farm rather than taking them up the front of the farm. So there is going to be a secure fencing and hedging right around that farm, including down along the footpath link. And that will keep the farm separate and actually protect the farm from any future occupants. Okay. I'm not seeing any other indications. So, Paul, thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm going to ask Darren now for his comments. Okay, members, um, just to, to, to get square on, uh, the agent did quite correctly refer to the number of houses uh, that are proposed in the site. And I, I put the slides on the, the presentation for you. Those are the most up-to-date slides that you have before you, and that is what's before you. So there are, as he correctly says, there are... 25, 26 houses, sorry, proposed in this site. So the, the original scheme was for the 34, but it has been reduced down. So what is before you now is what is uh, to be decided by the committee today. So apologies for that, members. Uh, the report just needed updated. In terms of the various issues that have been raised, members, as the agent quite rightly says, and I think I've sort of grouped them into three as well, there are three real reasons here. There's the design and appearance, there's a footpath link, and there's the impact from farming. Uh, for me, approaching this application, the key one is the impact from farming. Uh, if that one, uh, members uh, give their views on that. The other two then, planning officers uh, and the agent, I'm sure, could uh, work together and look at the, the layout and design uh, of this. Uh, and I'm sure there's a willingness on behalf of the applicant and agent to, to overcome some of those issues. So the three things are on the table, yes, members. But uh, as I say, the key issues for us as planning officers would be the impact on the farm and also then the impact on the footpath link overlooking the neighbour. The other issues we could discuss if members were content uh, to, to do that. Okay, thanks, Darren. Members? Josephine? Yeah, th thank you, Chair, and thank you, Darren. 
Uh, just uh, first of all, in respect <laughs> of the, the, the footpath link, Mr Bradley has said that uh, the reason they have not put it across the Loch Macquarie Road is because they didn't want to put it in front. They didn't want to have residents walking in front of an active farm. I just wondered if Darren could comment on that. Is that it, that, that seems to me to be a reasonable reason uh, for not putting a, a footpath there, but I would be interested in Darren's opinion. Uh, secondly, is Darren content, Chair, that uh, the reduction in the number of houses from 34 to 26 does, uh, uh, is acceptable in terms of the overdevelopment of the site or the, the massing effect? And thirdly, then, the point that Mr Bradley makes, Chair, regarding uh, the odours, noise, dust, etc., from the farmyard, actually, um, the existing houses at Drummond Glen appear to be closer to the uh, to the to the farmyard than the proposed development, and uh, we've not had any evidence that uh, those residents in Drummond Glen have been adversely affected, despite the fact uh, that they are upwind from the farm. And finally, then, Chair, uh, just. Uh, uh, Darren has said that this proposed development is within the settlement uh, uh, limits of Loch McCrory. Uh, and yet, if we, 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 we know that the, the, an active farm is there and has been there for some years, and, and uh, if we were minded to refuse this application uh, because of the fact that the farmyard is there, does that effectively preclude development in that settlement limit? Because after all, Chair, you know, there is great need, particularly in rural areas, for housing. And this is a development of, make, uh, you know, mixed housing types and, and mixed uh, uh, affordability. So uh, I just wondered if I could have Darren's comments on that. Thank you, Chair. Sure thing. OK, uh, Councillor, happy to, to try and respond to those. So the, the footpath link, um, obviously it's uh, typical in modern housing problems that the footpath link goes in with the estate road entrance. Uh, in this case, that can't be, uh, isn't being pro proposed. Uh, the image on the screen then shows the, the connection along the edge of the road where a footpath link would be required. So you can see there are a number of entrances into that working farm along there. Um, the question is whether or not you could put a footpath along there and allow the farm to exist and the farm to operate safely uh, and whether that would conflict with pedestrians. If the footpath link was provided along there, it would have to leave room for the vehicles to come in and out, but it would be achievable in my view. It's a straight bit of the road. It's only a short bit of road. Um, there are good views in and out of the farm. So anybody walking along the footpath can clearly see anybody driving in and out. So there'd be no pedestrian safety issues as far as I would see. In terms of it impacting on the activities of the farm, again, if the existing accesses are kept free and people are allowed to drive in and out, then I don't think there'd be a conflict there. So I think if the land was available and you could provide it, there would be no reason why it wouldn't be provided. Um, as I say, uh, there's no pedestrian or road safety issues that the planning officers could see. DFI roads are also uh, in their comments saying there should be a footpath link along the frontage of the site. Uh, and that's an important consideration for members. In terms of the reduction in the numbers, uh, again, members, that's really a design issue and the appearance of it. Uh, there has been a reduction, yes, um, but the layout and the appearance of it, again, is something that would need to be negotiated maybe between ourselves and the planning uh, agent um, to try and overcome the issues. The back of the house is facing on to the edge of the settlement limit is an issue. The other site that was referred to has got a planting belt along it. This one, really, there's, there's no significant planting belt to try and screen that. So, you can imagine, members, if you're driving into the, the village, I don't know if I've got it here. Yeah, if you're driving in, you're going to see the back of the houses. Not exactly the most attractive view um, where you get the washing lines and the pipes from the back of the houses, etc. So, again, though, that would be a design matter that uh, we could negotiate with the agent and see if we can overcome that. So, if we set that aside, uh, odours and uh, from the farm, go back up. See the, that's the. So if you look on the, the slide then, members, on the screen, it's just catching up here. So on the screen then, you can see the existing farms with the red stars on them, and our sites are the three sites with the, the yellow stars. On the right of that then is the existing housing development. Now that housing development was approved some time ago and has been built and established. I don't know what was on the farm during that time, 
whether it was an active working farm, the buildings may have been there, but they may not have been used. They may have been used for something else. We don't know. What we have to go on is the basis of what's before us today. And the information being provided is that in both farms, there's intensive cattle and there's sheep as well. There's a midden, um, there's uh, tanks underneath them, there's smells, there's odors from slurry and, sl and silage, et cetera. So you have to look more in terms of our application side is what is there today, rather than going back and say, well, they got it back then, so we should get it now. There are no complaints from those people, uh, and that is accepted and, and is on the table, and environmental health are aware of that. They are upwind as well, and despite that, there's still no complaints. However, again, members, those houses are long established, the farm's long established. I, I, you know, you have to give that a uh, weight. This is a proposed new development with new houses. Those people coming in will be moving into the site. You could put an affirmative on saying that they may be affected by smells and odors, but the, the, the question then would be, well, does that give enough protection to the farmer? You know, if he then gets a complaint against him, does that informative mean that the, the residents can't do anything to that farmer through a complaint? And that would be the concern of officers that you are approving something here, knowing full well that it's beside a working farm where there are odors, there are noise, people moving in there are likely to complain. You know, and that's the approach that planning officers are taking it, rather than the other way around that nobody's complained so far, so we can approve more houses. Um, and as I say, then within the settlement limit, there are areas within settlement limits, so throughout the whole of the Fermanagh and Oma council area that um, may be inside limits, but you can't build on them. Um, beside uh, wastewater treatment works, for example, there's older protection areas where you just won't be allowed to build because of the smells. So just because land's inside a settlement limit doesn't mean it's 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 going to be uh, approved for development. It's a good inference. It's a good uh, indication that it will be approved, but you have to take into account local circumstances. You may not get housing in this, but you may get something else. Um, and just, so that's that's not just because it's inside the limit means you approve it, and that's not the approach. Okay, thanks, Darren. I have two more speakers, um, uh, but before I take my next two speakers, I'm just going to Philip. You're on the line there. Did I see your name? Yeah, I did indeed. So, can I ask you to give an opinion just on that informative uh, notion of writing in something? Uh, <clears throat> how much weight or not can we lay to that uh, with regards protection or not? of the farmer. Philip, can you hear us? Apologies, um, Chair, just had a wee bit of difficulty there uh, getting the mute button off. Um, no, I, I don't think an informative is going to provide a great deal of um, uh, protection to the um, to the farmer uh, in a case such as this, the issue which is going to have to be addressed. Uh, in the situation is that if there is a complaint made, uh, then the council itself would probably find itself in a position as to whether or not it was having to investigate whether or not a nuisance existed in that stage. Whilst there would be an informative on the planning permission, the people that would be moving in um, would be um, uh, would be uh, in a position whereby until such time as they'd actually had moved in and experienced it, they wouldn't know exactly what it was that they were getting into. So I'm not convinced that an informative uh, would provide a, a, a great deal of protection uh, to the uh, farmer in this instance. Okay, thanks, Philip. Uh, moving along to Mary. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Darren, I think um, Mr. Bradley and yourself refer to the biggest issue being the farm here that isn't yet yeah, you're nodding. So the other things are, are tweakable and, and fixable in your opinion. Personally, I think the design is quite a nice one um, from, 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 from my view. And I think there's good uh, adequate green space and separation from the farm to the houses. But again, I understand there's issues that you might have to overcome. And if that's tweakable, I'll focus on the farm issue. Um, I know Philip has said that and, and um, Paul, as it has referred to a situation in Mid Ulster where that kind of covered. Um, so the jury would be out there for me. Why would it work on one and not another? But the point I would take from it is the houses that are there, there is no complaint to date. I think that is also material, even though we can't assume that there be no complaints. I think it is relevant that in what is in situation at the minute on the ground, there has been no complaints. So there is a certain weight has to be put onto that. Um, you know, at this stage, when there is such close proximity, 
um, there would be something that would have arisen his head at this stage um, of a complaint. And bear in mind, we are within the settlement limit and housing is very much needed. I think we have to bear that in mind as well when we're making a decision on this. And I suppose to Darren, you know, that farm would look to bear with the owner of the three Riello stars. The farm won't be able to get any bigger. It is what it is now. So whatever activity is going on in that farm now will be what will be continue, in my opinion. And if there was odors or complaints or smells, um, they might have been identified by the occupants in the neighboring estate, I would have thought. Therefore, it would be likely that we wouldn't have complaints, I would hope, in the new one. Um, just what would be your response? That would be my view to it, Darren, but maybe, you know, I know there's, you can look at it either way, but I think where you have to give weight to one, you have to give weight to the other, because the fact is we don't know. So, uh, but looking at it, um, it seems a nice development, needed houses within the settlement limit. And um, if the tweaks can be made, I think the farm issue um, could be overcome. That would be my opinion. So just what does Darren's reply to that? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, keep your camera on for me, Mary. And Tommy. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Darren, could you bring up the, the, the block plan of uh, that was presented to us there, just the layout of the houses? Please. Which one is it? Uh, well, that, that previous one would do the, nearly the, the, aerial, the red. aerial image. Yes, sir. Uh, have you of the full site? You had one of the full site, I believe. Oh, sorry. So that's, I will look at that. There's three or so missing yeah, at the that's other the end. full plan, and then it's now, split in half. I believe in, even that would do just for my question. Now, uh, as presented to us here now, there was 34 on our list. Mm -hmm. uh, one detached, five townhouses. They're still there. So actually, the number of semi detached is reduced mm -hmm. from 28 yep. down to 20. Now, as I say, the way I'm thinking is that the other rate on that site would, I think, cause us all difficulty with proximity to the farm. Have you an indication of where those houses were, Darren? Were they on the to the to the right there, towards the farm, or or where exactly have the the reduction of the taken place on the plan? Yeah. Do we know? Uh, again, members, uh, I'm being very careful here, just in terms of making a decision in this application. Uh, it's what's before you. You're making a decision on it's not what he applied for and he's now changed to um so that change and what he's done isn't a material consideration if somebody applies for 50 houses to go down to 20 you don't go approve it's what's before you so what is what's before you acceptable or not is the question rather than what does he change from the previous plan Remember, so I, i'll be honest i wouldn't like to go down that road i know you may wish to well, sorry, Darren, just for clarification, is that plan there we're looking at, is that with the 28 houses? That's your proposed plan that's in front of you now. So that the is 28 the layout, houses that's, there. The layout that's in front of you, okay. yes, now. So apologies for the confusion there. So uh, what yeah, you have there... That might be what was presented, had that, the reduction. That layout, no, that lay, the, la, the layout is correct. So that's the three semis at the front, and then you come around the back. That's the layout there that it is before right. you. And, and just again, if you could bring it up again, Darren, there, another question on it. Uh, where the townhouses are there, does yeah, are they back on to the rear of other houses at the, at the right hand side there? I was just something else. And is there a gap there between two houses just there at the wee clump of trees? Jen, aerial image. No, you can see no. It shows like a, a very thin triangle there, but uh, no, it's at the other I end. I think I have an aerial image showing that, Councillor. But no, there's no footpath link through there. Um, right, good enough. Thanks for that, Dart. Thank you very much. Um, just in terms of Councillor Garrity's comments, just to respond to those, um, again, the differences between what other councils do and ourselves is something you have to take into account. But um, I don't know um, whether it's appropriate to, to say Mid Ulster are doing something, so we have to follow through. It's as I keep saying, it's what's on the ground here in this application set that you have to consider. An important issue, and it was one that Councillor Garrity mentioned herself. If you're hoping there's no complaints. That wouldn't, to me, be something that a planning decision really should rely on. It's either there will be no complaints or there will be complaints, but we're content uh, that the impact is such that uh, you should approve this development anyway. So that would be the response in relation to Mary's comments. Okay, thanks, Darren. All right. Um, you know, the, the way this is moving, you know, I'll be honest, I, I would be in favour of the revised approach, you know, but procedurally, Darren's telling us something, you know, about what we're considering and what we're not considering. 
Um, and one of the reasons why I'd be in favour of this is I, I do know Loch McCreef very well as a settlement, you know. And even when Paul was talking about the character of the approach from the southern side, I could just see exactly what he was talking about, you know. And like Mary, uh, I had written down in my notes here, the layout is neat and attractive, you know, especially with those mitigations in the view from from the Oma side, for example. And, you know, the way that there's three main hurdles in the way of this secure and approval, you know, I believe each of them are being addressed. So I, I really am seeking guidance from Darren. Um, you know, say, for instance, I am in favour of the revised proposal. Uh, is there some barrier in my way today of of realising that, you know, by way of a proposal? None at all. Uh, what's before you can propose to approve? Um, as I remember, it's the three issues, really, that uh, that you've identified or we've identified. The, the key one for me is the farming activities and the overlooking on the neighbour from the footpath link. I think if members express their views today, and we've done this in the past, express their views today on the farming activities, and we're content that uh, the application in principle should uh, should go forward with a favourable opinion, um, then you could delegate it back to officers and officers will negotiate, chat to the agent about those other issues, the layouts and uh, the footpath link to see what mitigation or changes could be brought to the table there to try and overcome the overlookings, for example, of the neighbour. What needs to be done there, that could be could be resolved. So I think if members were expressing favourable views today uh, in relation to the principle of this and then delegate it back to officers, we will, we will negotiate with the agent uh, and uh, see where we end up. Yeah, I'm going to let you think about that for a wee second, Barry, and I'm going to bring Paul in here just. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And uh, look, members, um, agree and support everything that Darren's saying. Uh, in terms of design and the layout, we're we're happy to take that back, and the agents sort of indicated a willingness that we can negotiate in that. Uh, the main issue is the the impact on amenity. Um, I wouldn't lose sight of of the absence of a footpath um, along the frontage of the road, um, and there's the potential to create a pedestrian safety issue there as well. If a, if a footpath is not provided, the statutory consultee, the expert, DFI roads are telling us um, that that's likely to create a, a pedestrian safety issue. I think the non-provision of a footpath there, the units at the at the front of the development, they are unlikely to walk along the back and then connect in. They're more likely to take a chance. And us approving the development uh, without that connecting footpath along the front edge will be putting those people at risk. Um, so I think members need to carefully consider that um, and, and take a view on it as well. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Paul. All right. You know, I, I agree with Paul and uh, Darren, and, you know, we have to be careful. We have to take into account uh, any perceived or any difficulties with the, with the site. But I think what, what Darren said is the way forward, um, you know, I think we as a council are a principal. We're in principle supportive of the development and uh, there's some issues to be ironed out. So um, I would propose accordingly that that we record our support in principle for the site uh, to be approved, the development to be approved uh, in the revised plan, uh, but ongoing discussions, you know, and delegated authority for the officers to continue those discussions conduct those discussions with the developer to achieve uh, appropriate mitigations, etc. So that would be my proposal, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Barry. John? I, I would be of a, a mind to second Barry's proposals with one addition. The farm once we talk about it as a farm, it makes it nice and cuddly and, and everybody has their, their little picture of the farm with the little ducks and everyone walking about. But it is a, an industrial site and I would like to ensure that it is properly secured along with the footpath. So if that could be included in, in the delegated back that the, the farm would be properly secured as well to, uh, uh, on a 360 basis, not just in the bit that's uh, towards the houses. So if this footpath was included, then the front of it would be properly fenced with designated entrances and exits, so to protect pedestrians and also to protect the 
the farmer when he's entering and, and leaving the site with his machinery. Okay. Barry, are you? Type of work that the officers are going to be undertaking, you know, so I would see, you know, that already in there. Part of the negotiation. Yeah. yeah. And, but it was kind of reassured a wee bit, I have to say, by Mr. Bradley when he said, when he was able to give us the, the particular use for each of the sheds, you know, in, in response to Councillor Rennie's questions earlier. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm not seeing any other indication, members, so are we all agreed? Okay. And Earl, you just want to indicate? Just to uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry for being late to the meeting in the lower meeting in town. Uh, sorry for being late, and I just want to say that I'm not part of the decision-making process on this one. Okay, thank, thank you. you for letting us know. Chair myself also. And Glenn is also letting us know that as well. He's joining us online. Okay, thank you, members. And Darren? Okay, members, so uh, application number 1, LA 10, 2021-0257. Uh, the recommendation was to refuse planning permission. Uh, members have uh, uh, put forward their opinions uh, and have delegated the application back to officers uh, with a view to investigating uh, mitigation uh, and means of overcoming the various issues. Um, the application then will be considered within the scheme of delegation, so members will be notified when a recommendation does come forward before you. And if you want to call it in again at that stage, that option is there for you. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Okay, we'll thank you. On. All right, we're going to move on to application number two, LA 10 2022 0497, change of house design from previously approved. Okay, members, so uh, application two, LA 10 2022 497, uh, as a change of house type from a previously approved dwelling for Mr. Carson. Uh, and the location then is Akira Scream Road in Greencastle. Recommendation is to refuse permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to three reasons. Uh, so members, the application, you'll note from the report, the application has approval on the site uh, for an infill dwelling. And that approval is subject to conditions in respect of the, the height of the building. Um, the proposed house then changes the height of that and the appearance of it as well. So this is really not a principal issue. This is purely a design um, before you members. So the principal of the house has been approved and the applicant has the fallback of, of building what has been approved. So the site then, you can see on the right hand side is the aerial image showing the uh, location of the site. And on the left then is the application site. So it's a red rectangle, road frontage plot along the edge of the road with the buildings then either side. The plans then show the location of the, the building on the site. So it's along the existing building line with number 27 next door. Um, the land then rises up from the road uh, towards the yellow star and then on up to the rear of the field. And that's the proposed house. So uh, two, two floors to the house, or a story and three quarters maybe would be best described as. Um, it has an eight metre ridge. Uh, so you can see from the, the ground level or up to the top of the, the highest part of the ridge is eight metres. The two projections out the front. Um, and uh, then the sunroom extension out to the side. And that's just an image then showing the rest of the elevation. So top left is the, the front elevation, and then you have two, the side elevations on the right, and the rear elevation uh, at the bottom left. So as part of the uh, supporting information, the applicant is pointing out that the ridge height will not change from the previous uh, approved plans. So this is the cross section has been provided, and you can see the finished floor level and the ridge height, etc. Uh, the dimensions there, um, and the proposed house then will have the same uh, height. So if we just go back, so that's the approved house. You can see 205.6 at the top, and the new house then will have 205.6. So that'll be achieved by lowering the ground level, uh, the finished floor level, and the, down into the site and cutting into the slope. So really, members, the, the question, there's two questions before you, uh, the design and appearance of the house, and also then the differences between what was approved so the bottom right is the approved plans uh, and the proposal then is in the top left. That's the side view then on the approved plans on the right then and uh, uh, the proposed plans are then on the left hand side of the, the proposal. So uh, obviously the critical issue here is the site is located in the area of outstanding natural beauty. Uh, it's approved as an infill site um, and the policy then talks about how the infill should respect the local area and respect the local character. 
So traveling along the road, you have the existing building bungalow at the edge of the road. Um, and then if you move along the road to the right hand side there, you can see we come towards the application site. And that's the site then in front of you in that green field with the other buildings then uh, the other side of the fence. Another image then just looking into the site. And you can see the adjacent buildings nearby. And that's an image then of those other buildings. And then if you, so if you're back, uh, sorry, if you're there, then you just turn around, you're looking back into the site. You can see the, the bungalow then further back up the road where we came from, the application site then, and then there are our buildings next door. Beyond those buildings, then there's another bungalow uh, building then sitting at the edge of the road. So three existing buildings at the moment. And the proposal then is to put that in the gap in between them all. And that's the side elevation. So you will see the side elevation along the, the appearance in the front of it. Um, so the, the applicant has put in examples of other houses uh, in support of the application. Uh, and this happens quite frequently uh, with design issues. Uh, it's something to bear in mind, members, because you know this house will be a, a presented back at members as well. Uh, if it is approved so those other examples um, you can see them on the screen there's various examples of houses there uh, and there's more than and the images provided you can see them there um, in terms of those members it's it's something that really for me as a planning officer each site must be looked on its merits that's the old phrase we always hear everywhere i'm sure you've heard it for a long time from planning officers those other sites yes they are there they are approved some of them are approved with landscaping and various other means of mitigation and screening. Some of them really they're, they're, they're not as obvious and as, as open to this site as, as in comparison. Uh, I don't think uh, really the idea of just saying that was approved there so I should get it here is really an important some thing that should be should be you know brought to the table. There are plenty of other examples in the area and I haven't done it for, for the obvious reason that I don't think it's right to do it. There are other examples in the area of houses in the AONB that are of high quality design meet all the, the, the character and appearances that we would we'd be as a council seeking to, to approve in the area of outstanding natural beauty. Other application sites as well, applicants have changed the design in response to comments from up from planning officers uh, and uh, the members as well. So they've changed the design to a more suitable design and appropriate design for the, the area of outstanding natural beauty. So design for me, it's a consistency issue. Uh, and I think if we're approaching this application on the basis that are we being consistent in our advice and our approach, uh, as a council, um, then that's sustainable position. In terms of the policy, the CTY policy, CTY8 policy that it was approved, the policy says that uh, the new house should respect the existing development pattern in terms of the scale, size, scale and siting. Uh, and that's the key issue there, members, that's, that's the policy context you're looking at. So you can see in the guidance below that, there's an image then giving advice and guidance on, on what infill opportunities should look like. Um, and you can see there from the Buildings on Tradition booklets, you have an infill opportunity with a yellow star. And really it's difficult to spot that infill opportunity in the context of what's there at the moment because it fits in so well. So the idea is that you respect that local character, that local scale. Uh, and as I say, that one does, does very well. There's, there's a photograph within the Buildings on Tradition booklet as well, again, and it says uh, quality infill at existing ribbon. And again, you can hardly spot the infill house because it's so well designed to keep in and respect that existing character. And that's the important issue members before us today. And I say that's a consistent approach with all infills throughout the area and other sites people have applied for two story houses and come down to bungalows on the basis of advice from officers because of this policy and these the guidance is there. So in terms of reason for refusal, three reasons. Um, the county to NH6 uh, very outstanding natural beauty. Uh, the second one then is a lack of integration. Uh, although the, the floor line of the house is being reduced down the, and the ridge height will stay the same, the visual impact of that building is a, is a far larger building than the one that was approved. Uh, and the bulk and massing of that will not visually integrate onto the site. It's not necessarily the height of it, it's the bulk and massing and the visual appearance of it. Um, and again, then the C2I8 is the, the policy basis for this. So existing development pattern in terms of size, scale and setting. Okay, thank you, Darren. And now we have our agent, Aidan Begley. And uh, Aidan, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, yep. Okay, Aidan, you have your 10 minutes, so the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, committee. Um, right, the site is the front section of a large agricultural field, which lies between numbers 25A, 
27 Locust Grover Road, Greencastle, with number 25 making up the third building in the substantially built up frontage. The field slopes upwards from the road level. Planning has stated that the proposal is not of an adequate design scale size for the locality within the ANB and will be a prominent feature in the landscape. This application is seeking a change of house design from that previously approved under plan approval LA10 2021-0449RM by using datum levels between the previously approved and this proposed design we can prove that this proposal will visually integrate and not be a prominent feature in the landscape as suggested by planning. The previous planning approval LA10 2021-0449RM the existing site level is 197.5 metres at road level and sloping up to 200 metres at the rear of the site. The approved floor level was 199.6 and the approved ridge height 205.6. The proposed design in front of you today has uh, the site level is reduced to 197.65 over the entire site. Um, the proposed floor level will be 197.84, leaving it 1.76 metres lower than the previous approval. And the proposed ridge height remains unchanged at 205.6. Now, what's worth noting is the ridge height of the three properties surrounding the site is as follows. Number 25, the ridge height is 204.65. Number 25A has a ridge height of 209.91 metres. And number 27, the ridge height is 204.41 metres. The committee should be aware that from the levels previously stated, the ridge height of 205.6 on the approved design and this proposal. Furthermore, number 25A sits more prominent in the landscape with the ridge height of 209.9 metres, a difference of 4.31 metres higher than this proposal. Number 25A may be slightly more elevated, but will definitely be more prominent in the landscape. The development management report states that the proposed ridge will be eight meters above ground level. This is incorrect. By lowering the site, the ridge height as shown, the height will still be six meters above what is existing ground level. Therefore, this proposal will not be a dominant feature in the landscape and will indeed integrate with the building surrounding the site. The planning report refers to two large front projections being unacceptable. The committee should note that the previous design LA 2021 0449RM granted approval for the same two front projections similar to this proposal, and this was not contrary to policy NH6 of PPS2. In fact, there has been a reduction in both of the projections resulting in a reduction in the overall footprint and scale of the proposal. The two front projections of differing ridge heights and widths is in keeping with house design in the locality as number 38 Aquas Grover Road, approximately five meters, 500 metres from the site, and 209 Greencastle Road, approximately 13 meters, 1300 metres from the site, have three front projections with differing heights and widths as per the images that uh, Darren had shown there. Photographs of these two properties were emailed to planning on the 30th of the 6th, 2021 when considering LA10 2021-0449RM as comparable designs. Committee, in simple terms, the difference in levels between existing road level and finished floor level is 2.11 on metres on the previous approval. The difference in levels between existing road level and finished floor level on this proposal is 0.35 metres. So by lowering the site to road level, keeping ridge height at the same datum level as previously approved, and reduction in footprint, there is no doubt that this proposal will integrate into the landscape. Basically, this proposal will be no more prominent in the landscape than the previous approved design under LA10 2021 rm and a lot less prominent than number 25A <coughs> Aquas Grieber Road, which has a ridge height of 4.31 metres higher than this proposal. Just to make sure that the committee is fully aware that the ridge height of this proposal will be no higher than the proposal, proposal that was previously approved. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, committee. Okay. Thanks, Aidan. First, have we any questions for Aidan? Okay. Uh, Len? From your bit of Carly, um, I just wanted to ask uh, Aidan in terms of the projections. Uh, you said that the projections were in line with um, 
uh, the locality in terms of different sizes. Uh, is the proposal to you, it looks like it's a stone finished, is that right? Um, yes, stone finish. Stone yeah. finish across the projections and the and the whole frontage, isn't that right? Sorry, the, the whole the whole dwelling bit on the stone, yeah. Oh, the whole dwelling the stone, yeah, no problem. Um, no, I just wanted to check that because I suppose uh, it does in some ways reduce the impact of the of the projections uh, when they're they're all in stone. But well, thanks for that, Aidan. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right. Just to check with Mr. Begley there, if he said that one of the uh, buildings is more prominent, was it number twenty five? Uh, number 25A is more prominent. Right, number 25A is more prominent than the proposed one. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank okay, you. no other members indicating. So, Eden, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, Councillor McCann has, in support of the application, a written submission, which I will uh, now read to the committee. This is one of them applications where I struggle to understand why a recommendation to refuse has been brought forward. The application does meet the policy tests in relation to infill, and when compared to other buildings in the immediate vicinity, the proposal is actually smaller in stature. The agent has proposed to reduce the overall size of the building by reducing the footprint area and by lowering the floor level to meet the approved ridge height. What more is the applicant to do? In relation to neighbouring properties, the average ridge height is 206.32 metre, substantially higher than the application before you today. I fail to see how this application can be deemed a dominant feature in the landscape, and this proposal will indeed integrate well into the local landscape. The application is very similar to what was approved under RM, any minor changes that have been made to the design are indeed minor and do not warrant refusal. As a committee and as local councillors, we all know how difficult it is to achieve planning permission in the country. This application has overcome the policy test and I believe the applicant and the agent have went above and beyond in trying to address the officer's concern. By lowering the site to road level, keeping the ridge height the same as previously approved, and by reducing the footprint of the building, there can be no argument that this building doesn't integrate. I therefore encourage you to grant Mr. Carson approval here today. Councillor McCann. Okay, Darren. Uh, members, I'm happy to take any questions really, but um, if I could just point out there's really two issues here. Um, and the first one is not, is the ridge height the same as the other one? That's not the issue. The issue here is whether or not that building that's proposed, so let me just go back to it. The building that's proposed, that one there, um, fits in with the character, or the existing character along this frontage, along this infill. Uh, and I put up the slides of those existing buildings that are there. So that's the first question. Does it fit in with that existing character? It's not, has it got the same ridge height as those? There is an established character along there of modest buildings generally with a single floor, uh, so single story appearance, and especially the road frontage ones. This one's going to be in the middle of that. It's not in keeping with that character, and there's very little comment from the agent in respect of that. There's a lot of comment about ridge heights. That's not the issue. The issue is here, as I say, the, the bulk and the massing and the scale and the appearance of this in the context of what's there. If it was purely the ridge height, uh, and members are content with the ridge height and content with that size and scale of a building going in there, then again, similar to the last one, I think we could easily resolve that with the agent and overcome some of the issues. In terms of projections that are there, um, if I go back to the previous slide. So you can see the difference. So the one on the bottom right is the approved one. So that's uh, a design, members, I'll be honest, it's commonly approved around OMA. Uh, you'll see it, I'm sure, when you're driving around the countryside of OMA in particular, where you'd have a rectangular block with two front projections coming out uh, at the either end with the, the house entrance in the middle. That's something you see all over the place. Uh, so it is a design feature and a design appearance that is commonly approved. The two projections have a symmetry to them. They are in the 
proportion to the existing house. They're the same size and scale, they've got the same windows. There's an attractive, pleasing appearance to them. Not saying that the one in the, the, the new house is not attractive, it's just that the symmetry is all out of proportion. So you can see the two projections are different ridge heights. So that's the first issue. They're also different widths. So one's wider than the other. They've also got different windows on it. So again, the symmetry that would be in the bottom right and the, the sort of the pleasing appearance that comes from that uh, in terms of the planning guidance that we would, we would uh, use isn't there. It's a type of design really that hasn't been approved around the area of OMA. It's not something that I'm very familiar with when I drive about or haven't seen decisions come before us. It's the type of thing we would say to people, can you change the projection to have the symmetry to them to maybe overcome the issues there before that? Uh, and people commonly do that and the, the applications then go forward on it. So the same members, in terms of the differences between the two, there is a significant difference. This one that's proposed is not something that's been approved before that I'm familiar with in the area. When you drive around locally, there's not really any examples of this type of design in the AONB that's there. There are examples with houses with front projections, yes, but they'd be more in the bottom right rather than the top left. So see, the critical issue for members is, is this house in keeping with the established houses that are there uh, and then the overall design? If members are content that this house can go on the site, I think if it's just purely design, then we could discuss with the agent and maybe overcome those issues. Just to see that image there, Chair, um, could that be right. brought forward a bit more? We have quite a distant view of it. You know, that last slide that you had there. Let's go back. Sorry, sorry. Oh, just a second. So, let me just catch up. Okay. So, that's the view from the neighbouring property looking towards the site in the middle. And as you just move along, that's looking at it from sort of the front corner. Can we not? And if you turn around in the back, look back on yourself. That's... Well, the image from the middle kind of just showed the field. It didn't show the context. That's why I, I've gone for the corners so you can see. Because the critical issue here is the buildings either side of it, members, as well as the, the prominence and the height of it. The ridge height will be the same, but the critical question is, does that building fit in with the buildings that are either side of it? That's the important question. Is there's very little about that in the agent's speaking right? So there's a lot about the ridge height, yes, but it's whether that building fits in with the buildings either side of it. Ah, uh, Scriba is quite rural, obviously. Um, just a question. Is Greencastle, you know, the village of Greencastle, or the settlement of Greencastle, um, is it in the AOMB? Mm. You know, the, the reason I ask that is it has some of the finest houses like that there on either side of the crossroads, uh, protruding for a mile or two miles. It's unbelievable. See, from, from Greencastle crossroads to Formal and from Greencastle roads back towards Ruski, mm -hmm. would you agree that there's about Eight houses like that there, of of that kind of high quality finish, stone appearance, you know, really really impressive, you know, mm -hmm. not 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 you know to use the word modest, fine houses of that character, either side of the crossroads in the AOMB of Greencastle settlement. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not doubt what you're saying, Councillor. The, the question though, the question though, for members today and the planning decision. It's local character you're looking at. It's not necessarily going a mile up the road and saying there's a house there the same as it. It's what you've got here, and as I say, that image that I put up with the, from the guidance, where you have the you have the slide then showing the, the infill opportunity. This is what the policy envisages infills to do, so they fit in, and you wouldn't even notice that you filled it in. Uh, again, with the photograph, you're trying to spot the house has been infilled in the gap because it fits in so well with the others. You can see in that image there. There's a lot of different characters and styles there, um, and a wide variety of house types. Some very old, some sort of maybe 60s is it 70s i don't know and then the more modern ones so the critical question is not is there a house up in Greencastle? similar to this the critical question is what's either side of you and does it fit in to those houses either side of you and if there were two-story houses similar to this we wouldn't be here today but it's that key question then reference to the aonb is also not relevant not oh it is, it is it is yeah because this is aonb location so uh, the policy is asking you to enhance it uh, it has to be um, sympathetic to special character of the aonb which in this case is the houses either side of it and that local area. Otherwise, you would, you, you know, you you're, if you extend it out to a large radius, there's such a mix of house types probably in there. You know, how would you design a house? Just the reason I say that is there's a unique situation in Greencastle of being in the AONB and houses of that type presenting at least eight that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. and they're in a, well, you know, they're, they're together, you know. Uh, yeah. 
they're in a, a continuous line, but not close together, if you know what I mean. Either side of the crossroads. Now Scriba is part of the Greencastle community. So uh, I can understand why people would want to go for a design like that when they see neighbouring homes of that character. Yeah. Yeah, so that's yeah, just if I could stress, Councillor, yes, that's up at the crossroads. Yes, that's fine. When you're down at this location here, the policy test and the policy before you is what's the other side of you? That's what you're looking at. Similar up at the crossroads. If somebody wants a two story up there, again, similar situation. So what's before you down at this location is the key issue here. Okay, moving to Josephine. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Darren, for your presentation and for your advice. And thanks also to uh, Mr. Begley for his presentation. Chair, could I just ask Darren uh, to bring up the slide showing the original uh, reserve matter uh, planning approval and then the new the new design? Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. Now, Chair, when I when I look at that slide. To be perfectly honest, I, I, I don't see a huge amount of difference between the do, two designs. Now, Chair, I do accept um, Darren's comments that um, the, 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 in the new application design, uh, the two projections are uh, not symmetrical, uh, but they're very similar. They're, one is slightly wider than the other. And I do also note the change in the design of the window. But just looking at that, um, I don't see a huge amount of difference between the, the two houses. And Mr. Begley has also uh, uh, illustrated to us that by uh, reducing uh, the ground level, it will uh, uh, result in the new application not really being very prominent on the landscape. And we've seen the slide of the field, the application site, and how it slopes up. Um, so from that, that perspective, I would be satisfied that it wouldn't be too prominent on the landscape. So just bearing in mind, Chair, uh, Darren's comments that he could possibly, if we were minded to uh, recommend this application for approval, that he could work with the agent and the applicant on those design features. The way I see it, that with a bit of tweaking to get the symmetry a bit better, I think that uh, uh, that house could fit very well into the gap site and not be overly prominent or sticking out like a sore thumb uh, in that particular location. So just wondered if I could have Darren's comments on, on, on those observations, Chair. Thank you. Well, the, the sticking out like a sore thumb is, is something I don't want to say, but certainly I keep going back to it. When you've got a bungalow, a gap and a bungalow, it's very difficult to see how a house like that, which is what a story and a half or story and three quarters, will not stick out like a sore thumb. And so far as the buildings either side have a definite character to them, an established character, and this one is, is connected to that. But I certainly agree with you. If members are content that a house or maybe of that ridge height could fit in, then with uh, agreement and sort of uh, willingness on the other side, we could we could overcome some of the design issues, I think. So, yeah, mm -hmm. good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, I mean, I, I would be uh, minded to make a proposal, Chair, uh, that we would recommend this application for approval and and authorize the planning officer to work with the applicant and the agent to tweak uh, the design features uh, uh, as as suggested by by Darren. I'd make that a proposal, Chair. Could, could I also propose it's delegated back to officers as well? Uh, and I would propose that it's delegated back to officers then. Okay, thanks, Josephine. John? Yeah, um, looking at the two designs, I'm I'm of a, of a of different opinion. They're 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 very much different. One's a complete stone render, the other is a mixture of render and stone. If we look at the two houses that are originally there, one's rendered, one's a traditional, probably late seventy late sixties, early seventies brick and render finish. And a total stone building there I don't think is going to integrate. Um if you take horses out to jump them at an event and you've won at 12 hands two and you've won at 14 hands two, if you dig a hole and put the 14 two into to make it 12 two, it's still 14 two. So that's a bigger house. It, it stands out. It, it changes the, 
the three houses in a row, it, it, it's totally different from the three. And, and I think that we should just go with the officer's recommendations. They do have plan permission and they have what seems to be a very good house. And I think that uh, I would be going with the officer's recommendations that we uh, don't uh, recommend this. OK, thanks, John. Can I just check? I'm not going to bring you in just right now, Glenn, but can I check your hand is up from the last or is that you wishing to speak now? Yeah, I'd yeah. like to speak when, when suitable, Chair. OK. And Tommy? Yeah, good morning, Chair. No, just on the on the points made by Councillor McClockery, the, the render finish and, and indeed uh, the question of the symmetry between the, the two projections, would that or would Darren envisage that as being part of the discussions he would take uh, following Councillor Dehan's proposal? Uh, yeah. could, the, could those points be ad addressed in any further negotiation? Uh, obviously, it's, it's something that can be put on the table to the applicant. If they're willing to do various changes, we look at those sympathetically. Uh, members, like we don't we don't enjoy refusing. We're not here to refuse. We're here to find solutions. And much with the other applications where design has been an issue, we've been successful so far. We will overcome the issues if there's a willingness to do that. Um, I'll be honest, if members are and, and listening to what the views are and some members, if members are content that you can get a bulk and massing, a size and scale of that house, then it's design. We can sort that out easily enough, I think. Yeah. But it depends to say on members. If members are not content with this, uh, could I maybe suggest members that it is uh, Pass back to officers to go back to the applicant to see if we can get an agreed design rather than going as a refusal. Because I think if a refusal is issued, that's the end of it. Whereas I think if members are putting forward their views that it's not acceptable, we could go back and say to them, listen, could you maybe look at changing this? Uh, and I'm sure there's a willingness there from them to do that. Yeah, I'm going to let you back in, John. Just give me a second till we get my mice to cooperate with me. And here we go. Given uh, what Darren has told us, I'm going to withdraw my proposal if that's acceptable, Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, Glenn. Well, thank you, Chairman. Well, um, I suppose everyone interprets these things differently, and it's interesting, I suppose, that that the render was mentioned as a an issue. Uh, I would have thought, you know, in an area of um, outstanding nat natural beauty, that actually a stone finish. Uh, is appropriate and should be promoted. In fact, uh, I probably feel that um, that stone finishes is to be promoted um, across the district. But having said that, I know that Darren does say about, it's about keeping the local character, but you really do struggle to find uh, a stretch of road where you have three, four houses matching the character. You know, size and mass and perhaps, but I don't think that the proposal here is outside you know what's acceptable in terms of size and mass and i actually think as, as councillor dehina said very little difference when i look at the the slide with the two images on it you know uh, uh, clearly there's a difference in, in windows and uh, the two projections but very little difference in terms of the, the uh, to my mind so i would urge officers not to be uh, i suppose maybe two sore and stone finishes or to to, to differences in, in buildings because as i say if you go down any road you'll see uh uh, you'll see different character of houses, uh, and I also note there's a house sort of to the to the right as we see it, uh, with stone finish, and it's, it's obviously a bit further back off the road, you know, but it's certainly not matching the the house to the left. Uh, but but that in mind, and and given that uh, Councillor Deegan has made a proposal, uh, to defer back to the officers on on, on sort of tweaking, and I would stress that I'm I'm happy with the, the size and, and, and scale of the house as it stands, but with minor tweaks, I support Councillor Deacon's uh, proposal, and I would second it. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Glenn. Mary? Thank you, Chair. And just, Darren, could you put up just the policy page and then the two houses again, comparative to what was passed and what we have now? So, sorry, respects the existing development pattern along the frontage in terms of that. Now, you referenced, Darren, and just on that question that I have, what's on either side? Does it say either an exception or two houses within another way substantial? Yeah, maximum two exception. It's referring to the two houses specifically on either side? 
or does it work within? It's, yeah, it's, it's the frontage councillors really. The like the, the the application, the principle of this house was approved as an infill. Yeah, and the idea being that you would put the new house in and uh, would fill a gap in and wouldn't change the character of the area. You wouldn't even notice there's a new house in there essentially because you just lost a small gap and the, the image in the bottom with the yellow star i think is, is a very good example and i have used this on other cases with with uh, applicants with relation to design uh, and they've gone away after this and looked at it and changed it and and have, have got overcome the policy issues um so certainly in terms of this site here it's the frontage that you're looking at and what's along that frontage and there really is an established frontage uh, of those bungalows and respects the existing development pattern could that phrase be taken in a wider context within policy? Well, it says what the context is, uh, Councillor. It says in terms of size, scale, siding, and plot size. So there's the four things. That's that's what the development pattern. Yeah, but again, I could refer that back to respect to exi existing development pattern with regard to size, scale, and setting. That is, you know, the existing development. I suppose what I'm trying to say is, darn. There's an existing development pattern that is existing in that area. I think it was referred to by Councillor Michael Duff. And I, I suppose I'm, I'm flipping it on the lid here because the existing development pattern is not of that of to which, particularly to the house to the left, is, is in situ, if you know what I mean. And I imagine this is a, a young man and, and wanting to put his own stamp on his house. And if we go back to the, the house, the two, the comparative houses, what was passed and what wasn't. Um, I kind uh, I agree with Josephine and first um, vision there's very little difference now when you dig into it and you go through it down you can clearly see the ridge height my concern would be and I have to be consistent and I'm, I'm not going to make a counter proposal because I think there's there's agreement in, in, the, in the grouping but I remember a plan application that had loads of reason for refusal and it was in a really big massive scaled house maybe up the A5 but there was one stickler for me was the 10 year rule I actually believe it is overcoming we may have went again legal advice in that but um I have to be consistent in that I think if someone wants to build a particular site for me it has to be in their view so personally I have no issue with um the the design or the, the, the change design, I would say, and it, it would appear we're going back to the agent and to see can any tweaks be made. The, the part of the house on the left, and I may be wrong, I think originally there was an upstairs downstairs. It looks to be like the left now would be an elevated maybe living room or something um, with high, high, high roof on it. I don't know if there's an upstairs comparative in that, and it, that would be a design that maybe the applicant has wanted to go with. So, you know, by, by by changing that and I don't I know we can't go back to um Mr. Begley at this stage on that one, but I think we have to be minded in that if they don't want to change that, we have to be really sympathetic. Personally, the, the house design change is acceptable to me. Um I because there's agreement here and maybe if there's agreement with the applicant to make some changes that uh, um, makes better reading as far as policy as far as officers are concerned i'm happy to go along with that but i have to be consistent with my own views and uh, to know that that house to me would be acceptable but i hope when it's referred back um darn to yourself and the agent and the applicant that some resolution can be made and that they can get approval it's good that there's approval there already and hopefully it'll, it'll work out in the end but i have to be honest from my own opinion so just to put that on thank record thank you Jim. thank you mary Earl. Very much, Chair, and uh, I don't think it's in any of our interest to ever, you know, to refuse uh, planning permission for anything. I'm just a question to Darren: Has there been, you know, intense negotiations with the agent and the applicant with regard to this? Yeah, the, the difficulty I'm finding as a planning officer in negotiations is I need to come to the planning committee first to get your views on it before applicants and agents will really get into serious negotiations. So there has been a lot of discussion on this. There's discussion, uh, but certainly, good. like I mean, if there's a willingness here to resolve this, we can we can find that. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, there's nobody else indicating. So I have a proposal on the table proposed by Josephine and seconded by Glenn. Are we all in agreement, members? Okay, then. We uh, leave it in uh, Darren's mm -hmm. capable hands to uh, ensure that uh, yeah. the correct outcome is arrived at. Darren. So, members, the, the recommendation then was to refuse planning permission. Uh, members have uh, gone contrary to the recommendation and have delegated the application back to officers, not me. 
uh, officers to determine and consider. Uh, the application will be determined within the scheme of delegation. Uh, so if there's any issues, you will be informed about it. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. And at 10 to 4, I'm going to take a comfort break. So uh, if we come back around 5 past, that would uh, thank you.
and we're all listening to me, John. Yeah, <laughs> and that's good. And it's LA 10, 2022, and it's, could have even done that. And 0867, two-story dwelling domestic garage. Okay, members, so application three then, uh, LA 10, 2022, 867, an outline application for a new dwelling and domestic garage by S. Patterson. Uh, and the location then is 100 metres north northwest of the junction of Home Road and Dewey Road in Drumquin, with the access off the Home Road. Recommendation is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the three reasons. So, uh, members, will just take you through. So, the application is under CTY 10 as a, as a dwelling on a farm, and the applicant has supplied the farm maps. And you can see there's an extensive holding of land within the yellow line. And that's the other map then, the second map. So extensive area of land within the farm business. And the site itself then uh, is located on that farm holding. Uh, the farm is uh, active and established. The farm business is active and established and no development opportunities have been sold off. Uh, the sole issue really relates to the siting of the house uh, and that it doesn't visually link or cluster with an established group of buildings on the farm. So the site location plan then, you can see on the screen then the red line uh, of the, the site. It's within a large parcel of blue land uh, that's within the control of the applicant. Just is it, oh, sorry, just a drawing. Um, so I'll come on. I'll come on in more detail on that drawing, members. But just to give an idea of where we are, that's the application site. Then, so you can see the the public road, and then the large field running up to the hedge at the back of the the field, and you can see the site is proposed to be up in that corner. Uh, with the land then rising up to, towards the location. Access then will run along that side boundary but doesn't come out in front of the photograph. It actually cuts across to the left on the other public road and the agent has provided a, an image showing that. So I say that's the context of the site. So in terms of the, the, um, the location, you can see the site is identified with a yellow star on it uh, and it's up in the corner of the field. Access then will run down the field boundary but then will cut across onto the home road uh, so it doesn't come out on the Dewish Road. Um, the applicant has provided a supporting statement uh, in relation to the application for the location away from the farm buildings. Um, and uh, I think all parties agreed it doesn't officially link or cluster with an established group of buildings on the farm. Um, there are buildings on the farm and these are identified by the red star down at the bottom of the slide across the home road. Uh, there are a number of poultry units. And you can see those then on the, the slide in front of you. So there are three units in um, out beside the red star. To the left of that then is a small field and then there's other buildings there, uh, which you understand are the farm buildings. So that's the, the poultry shed, um, well kept uh, poultry unit. Uh, so as I say, the field to the right then with the cattle on it is that image there. And, uh, that's within the applicant's control and then I think the farm buildings is here or beyond that. So the applicant has provided a supporting statement um, and put forward an argument that uh, they cannot build beside the, the poultry sheds for a number of reasons. Uh, the main one of those being the impact upon the amenity uh, of the residents. Uh, and they've applied a 150 metre exclusion zone around the hen houses. And they've also included then a, a red zone, which is a 75 metre exclusion zone uh, around the existing farm buildings on the left hand side. So just to give you an idea of where our site lies in relation to that on the aerial image, you can see that it's about 160 metres um, from the, the boundary to boundary with the site then, the house will be on the other side of it. Um, and um, it'll be separated from the, the farm buildings. So no doubt uh, there'll be no visual linkage. Um, in terms, just to go back members, in terms of those distances, the 150 metre uh, separation distance or exclusion zone around the hen houses, those are the applicants' hen houses. Uh, just to confirm that um, and the red lines then again those are the the farm business uh, is in control of those buildings um, those two exclusion zones the 75 meters and the 150 meter exclusion zone are not planning policy there's no reason why somebody can't build beside a poultry shed if they want to uh, especially if they're the applicants and they own them if they were in third party control there would be issues then obviously um, but the applicant is in control of these sheds um, and just bearing in mind the comments that received on the first application for the houses in Lock McCrory, where we've approved houses beside third party farm buildings, those are material in this application and must be that approach must be adopted in this application. Um, so there are no exclusion zones, there's no plan policy to stop an applicant building beside his hen house if he wants to. 
Uh, in terms then of other building groups um, that are on the farm, you can see the hen houses in red, and uh, there are other building groups then in yellow, uh, which are within the applicant's control. One site specifically has been ruled out, and that's the site with the red star on it, where the applicant says it's it's a flood zone. Um, and you can see from DFI flood maps, it's not within a flood zone, and it's not affected by flooding. There's a comment that you wouldn't be able to get foundations on it, but again, um, that's an engineering issue. So today, they would be able to put foundations in there if they, if they needed to, of some degree. So in terms of reason for refusal, you can see the three reasons, members. Um, the first one is that uh, the site's not visually linked with a, an established group of buildings on the farm. And there's no demonstrable health and safety reasons or verifiable plans to ex expand the farm business at the existing building groups to justify an alternative position elsewhere. The second one then relates to the, the prominence of the site up on the, the slope. Um, the site lacks well-established boundaries to, to visually integrate a new building on, on a prominent uh, site. And the third reason then is the CTY1 issue. Uh, and again, that would fall, members, if, if you were content that the, the principle of the house was acceptable under CTY10. So really, if the two issues, you have the, the site away from the farm group and the prominence then on that hill. OK, thank you, Darren. Uh, we have uh, David McKinley, the agent. David, can you can hear I, us? I can indeed, yes, yes. OK, David, the floor is all yours. Perfect, OK. Uh, thank you, Chair and Committee, for allowing me to represent my applicant on this application. The application is for his only son returning home to farm. He, he intended, his intended wife is not a farmer. His granny lives still at the farmyard, which is number two. Darren, if you can throw up the location map again. Uh, number two is the farmyard, sort of the principal farmyard or what have you. His granny still lives there. His father lives in number five, which is opposite it, uh, uh, all on the Dewish roads. These dwellings were built before the hen house went up and has no mortgageable issues with them. To clarify, and the separation zone is very important in this, and in, in regards to mortgageability of a property, to clarify the separation zones in place of my dwelling, in relation to building a dwelling next to an active farmyard, if, for example, I applied to build within 75 metres of another person's farmyard, environmental health department, not necessarily planning, but the council would have issues due to smell, noise, and indeed health and safety, and would object and would recommend a refusal. I have spoken with my air model consultant, Erwin Carr. Uh, these are the people who I rely on when submitting a planning application for a hen house, of which we have a few applications in the present. They have informed me that as a rule of thumb, a 150 metre distance between the hen house and the dwelling is required. Anything closer to that, you will require an air model prepared. The mere fact that you require an air model means the dwelling is infringed by the hen house and in some cases an informative applied to a planning approval. This, the, this distance is imperative to the mortgageability of a dwelling. I have submitted in the past a statement from bank lenders' represent, representatives, the rules of a mortgage, which, by the way, is changing every month at present. Rules such as shared lanes with farms and farmyards are a no-go, similarly with the proximity with the farmyard, i.e. 75 metres, or in this case, a hen house. This office, to be fair, has had to amend other agents' approvals to, to actively move a dwelling further away and provide a new access to, to actually get a mortgage. So I'd ask the committee to accept that this is a material consideration and it can't, if, if it can't be funded, it won't be built. So basically, the location is extremely important. When, when submitting an, a, a statement in relation to availability of other sites, we ruled out the proximity in relation to the zones associated with the hen house and the farmyard. Uh, Darren did indicate uh, a red line site next to the junction of the Dewey's Road. Um, that th that um, I, I had a similar application, and, and funnily enough, the applicant was the owner of the hen house also. The only way he could get a mortgage on that because of the closeness to the hen house was a business loan from his farm. Now, that meant he'd have four or five years to pay off a 150 to 200,000 pound mortgage. That house will probably never be sold because the hen house is, is there. It would, it, would, it would interfere. So there is marketability issues as well. The fields, the fields to the north uh, is raising land. Uh, and the further up you go, the more likely it would be not to achieve a backdrop. We note the planning services location. And, and I think now you actually know where that is. It's, it's sort of at the end next to the road. Um, Darren, I sent an email this morning. I don't know whether you have it for the show there. 
to show the uh, the the, the, the committee, uh, I took a took a photograph from the oh, sorry, uh, a screenshot from, um, gosh, uh, the Homeview Road Junction and the Homeview Road Junction and the Dewish Road Junction, and it's, it's probably critical for 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 this next point that I'm trying to say. It's a CTY ten no visual linkage to the farmyard. I, I sent a sent an email and it's, it's available on Google Street View where it clearly showed. A red line around a red line around the, the site that showed the the excessive the excessive tree lines to the to, to the side of the site the, the, in this case the southern boundary and the rising backdrop to the rear. Uh, it also shows in the same photograph the hen houses and the dwelling viewed together in the one photograph. Um, I, I don't know whether you've got it there. No, maybe not. Yeah, sorry, apologies. It hasn't. The, the, the presentation hasn't saved it. But I mean, if you hang on a second, I'll get it up on the screen for you now, David. Perfect. If we can find it, Patterson. So, so, so basically, it'll show it'll show a rough outline in red of where the proposed site is uh, as access to the road uh, as well. Uh, this is really the only view, sort of viewing vantage point of the proposal is from the Dewish Road as a transient view traveling again north to south at a speed of excess 50 miles per hour. I doubt if you'll ever read a dwelling in this location. Uh, the planning officer's report indicated this is a roadside roadside site, uh, not a chance. This, this is should it be considered as a roadside site. This is located over 190 meters away from the Dewish Road and at least one field between the Dewish Road. And, 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 and the field that the dwelling sits in. Uh, in relation to this objection, I believe we have sufficient information in front of the committee to demonstrate that this is not the case. Uh, and I hope that will become more apparent if Darren can get the photograph up. Yep. Um, fusion number two is, is, is integration, as I understand. I have it down here from the planning officer's report to the council that is CTY 13 and 14. However, 14 seems to be been addressed uh, within the document, the planning report in front of you. Yes, that's that's the photograph I wanted uh, somebody to see. You can see the red line uh, around the access. Rough idea where the access is going up into the house, the site with the the strong tree lines to the to the west of where the house is going, and you can see the huge backdrop to the rear. Now, bearing in mind, we'll be we'll be creating a shelf to set a dwelling in there. Look to the immediate left of that photograph. You see the hen houses. Now, that's at the junction of. Home Road and Dewey Road, to me, these both visually relate to each other and and and, and sort of tick 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 point CTY ten and visual linkage out of the equation. Um, real character no build. Uh, CTY thirteen. This site is established boundaries. So I've discussed that. There's trees there of uh, eight to ten meters high on the western boundary of the site or the southern boundary on the map, which also gives an indication of where a ridge height could be. So if you can imagine a ridge height rattling across at the bottom three, going straight across there, that ridge won't become visible in the skyline. We've got a, we've got a, a tremendous backdrop sitting behind it against something fit to take a, to take a nice dwelling. Um, the sitting dwelling is nicely under the height of the trees. Again, this photograph only indicates the huge backdrop this site has. The backdrop is the second form of integration. So we have two forms of integration. We have a natural backdrop with rising land form, and we have trees to the the southern southern boundary, or in this case, when you're looking at that last photograph in front, the eastern, the western side of the site. We we did submit, as Darren pointed out, uh, a statement in relation to fields that weren't available. Um, we we would have issues with the zone, uh, and I, I I have an issue I have an issue with selling this to a mortgage company straight after gaining approval if it's within that zone, and that's that's not a lie. That is documented and, and, and a few of the applications that I put in. So I believe we have clear, two clear boundaries to suitably integrate the dwelling into this into this landscape. Um, and again, if the two previous objections overturned, then CTY will fall naturally, as this application will have been deemed to meet policies, uh, PPS 21. That's that's my uh, that's my presentation. Thanks for your time. Uh, I look forward to any questions. Okay, thanks, David. Thank you. Members. Mary. Thanks, Chair, um, Thomas, uh, and thank you, David. Just um, I might have picked it up at the start, David. You said there was um, Granny and Daddy and two houses up above. And did you mention there's no 
mortgageable issues there? Did I know that, that? That's exactly right. The uh, the two houses was there before the hen houses. If 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 number two or number five had to be rebuilt or and went for a mortgage on them, it's unlikely that they would receive a, a, a substantial mortgage offer on the house, if at all, because of the proximity of the hen houses. Hen houses and, and pig houses seem to be the two worst <laughs> offenders, believe it or not. Uh, uh, a farmyard's not as bad. That's why the zone on a farmyard's not as bad. But number two and number five have been there prior to the hen houses, yes. And are they there for many years, David? Yes. Yes, number five would be a relatively new bungalow. Uh, number two would have been the old traditional two-story farmyard with uh, a series of old farmyard buildings around it. Right. And that and would have been the principal farmyard for to build the hen houses, yeah. Right, and, and, and I will agree with you, um, I'm not from a farming background, but there's farms and then there's hen houses. So yes. um, I, I, I'm with you on that one, so that's something we live yes. in common. I suppose my next question is, the reason you're basing it outside this um, zoned area is for mortgage purposes only? Well, 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 mortgageable, yes. And your yes. deliberation there, it's, yeah. Yes, mortgageability and also, believe it or not, integration. There, there's fields to the to the south of that, just outside the exclusion zone, but they don't have really the tree lines that that I have there. I, I, also, also, there is a little bit of floodability issue on the field just north of the hen house, which give me an issue, uh, give me issues getting access onto the onto the home road, and that's why we've come down the boundary. Uh, and, and cut into the, the home road across sort of an area that's not floodable, yeah. if that well, makes sense. The, the, re the reason I ask that is because from us as a planning committee, um, we can only give, we can give that very limited weight, um, yes. the mortgage reason, um, and judging by the scale and scale of the, of the farm, there would be other means of, of, of achieving a mortgage, I'd imagine, if, to think outside the box. Um, I agree to I wouldn't like to be cited personally near a hen house, but that's my views and, and um, I would agree with you on that one. But you did Darren did identify the red star and you it said that it was in a flood zone, but then a map indicated it wasn't in a flood zone. Um what would be your explanation to that? Uh if Darren would go back to that map a wee second. Um someone's showing the red line on it. I've, I'm quite aware, and I'm hoping a few councillors are, that that area from the Red Star down towards the junction, uh, which we call the Mini Burns, is an area that floods quite often. Now, yes, the, the, that particular one is outside of it. I have the issue with I have the issue with the proximity, and we're right beside the hen house in this case. Literally, open the back door, and you have the hen house. Now, to be fair, the mucking out end of it, I think, comes out that end of the hen house as opposed to the other side. The hens goes in the front part, and then next to that red side would be where the, where where the hens, as I understood, the hen houses is emptied. Um, I I wouldn't have counted that as a site proposal because of the proximity to the hen house. Like and anything else for seventy five years within the hen house. I know the chairman hmm. want to move on. I'll find. So just to be clear, the red star was. Um, uh, discounted because of the closeness of the hen house, not absolutely. that uh, you're yeah. a few, that it's, it's, it's yes. not in a flood zone. Just for no, clarity. Absolutely. That's absolutely correct. My mistake. Okay, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Earl? Thanks, thanks Chair. Uh, thanks, David, for, for coming on and giving this presentation. Uh, just a, a bit of curiosity here, David, just with regard to the hen houses. Have you any sort of a, a date as to, maybe it's there, but uh, as to when they were erected, first of all? The, the, the hen houses are within the current 2000, and I think it was 2014 to 16, somewhere in around about that. They're relatively new. They are relatively new, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of the area, obviously, and, and uh, you're really at the foot the foot of, uh, of Granite Mountain there. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I know what you're saying about the, the money barns and the marshy area that would be. As you're coming on towards the the bridge there at the Moneyborns, it would it would be liable to flood, and there's no doubt about that. Uh, so thanks for uh, answering that question, and for, uh, for for the time being. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. There's no other indications from members speaking. So, David, thank you very much. Okay. I I'm going to move now. I have a written statement uh, from uh, Councillor Rosemary Barton. And dear planning committee, please accept my apologies due to unforeseen circumstances. 
and I appreciate your indulgence in accepting a written submission. Mr. Samuel Patterson is a young man returning home from working abroad who now wants to settle down and build a family home. It is his intention to work alongside his father in the poultry industry and eventually succeed his father in the business. Mr. Patterson Sr., having been involved physically working all of his life and now has the onset of physical mobility issues and knows that he will need help on the farm. He is also approaching retirement age and wants to enact succession planning for his business. As you will be aware, the agricultural sector has had difficulty encouraging young people into the industry, thus the majority of those engaged in agriculture are over 65 years old. Thus, the reason why farming has become such a dangerous occupation. Therefore, it is incumbent on this council to do all in their power to encourage youth back to the district and especially into agriculture, which is a huge economic driver in Fermanagh, Oma Council area. The original application was refused on two points. Firstly, the standard distance away from an active farm is 75 metre. However, I understand a standard distance from hen houses or pig, pig houses can be up to 150 metres. As the committee will be aware, when applying for planning permission for a pig or hen house, the air model required accesses more closely than further away. Required accesses more closely that than further away. Secondly, the site of this present planning application is the most suitable on the land as other sites are too close to the farmyards. The site has the proposed dwelling located in an area of tree cover, is visually linked to the hen houses and has rising land to the rear and is therefore a very acceptable site while also adhering to the regulations. Given that suitable sites on this farm are very limited. Thank you for your time. Councillor Rosemary Barton. Okay, and Darren, if you'd like to. Uh, no, members, happy to take any questions, really. Um, the issues are all set out in the report uh, quite clearly, so okay. happy to take any questions. Right. Josephine. Chair, and uh, thank you to Darren for his presentation uh, and to Mr McKinley as well. Um, Chair, uh, it, there appears to be conflicting view, views between Darren and Mr McKinley regarding the visual link between the hen houses and the application site. Um, could I ask uh, Darren if he accepts uh, uh, David's assertion and particularly when looking at that emailed photograph that there is a visual link? Uh, between the hen houses and the application site yeah. from that view. Thank you. Uh, I'll be also surprised to hear the, the, the sort of the argument being made that there is a visual linkage because if that is the case, then you don't need all the rest of the supporting information. It either it's visually linked, then you meet the policy. So uh, there's no need to go into all those, those other issues. Uh, no would be the honest answer from planning officers. It's not me, it's planning officers uh, on the ground who visited the site and discussed the application. The site's uh, nearly 200 metres, I think it is, away from those farm buildings. And on the road, so I can go through them again if you want. On the approach along the road, there's a significant difference uh, distance between the new house and those farm buildings. The new house is sitting up on the side of the slope. The farm buildings are on lower ground away on the other side of the road. So there's no visual linkage or, or clustering at all, unfortunately. Okay. John. Sorry, Darren, could I ask you to bring up the uh, the farm map again of, of the full farm size of the farm? So two, there's two, there's that one, so that's the first one. Right. That's sort of the oh. north half, and then you the bottom, second half. And, and that's just a, an in closer version? No, that's, that's the top half. You see the poultry sheds in the middle of that slide? Yeah. You can see them there, the three sort of lanes. So the, you, yeah. the second slide, there they are again. You can see there the three yes, right, right, south of the, right, the shed. It's got, um, sorry, it's, it's the other one I want, actually, yep, darn right. it. Thank you. 
at the at the top half is that another farmyard? Mm -hmm. is, is that the same? Just go back, maybe not system members. I think yeah, there, I'm, were I'm eight, not... there were three groups identified that I would identified from the, the, the farm maps. So really the poultry sheds in red. Uh, and I don't think any planning officer, any council officer or member would want to put somebody inside a poultry shed, uh, to be honest. So uh, it's respectfully they can be ruled out. Um, there are sites beside them that would suit, but I don't think that would be reasonable. Uh, never mind the mortgage issues. I just don't think it'd be fair. If somebody wants to do that, that's different. But uh, if they don't, uh, so there's no problem getting away from those poultry sheds. You then have those other groups. Uh, and as I say, whether there's sites all around those that could be developed as alternatives is something I think could be explored further. Uh, possibly looked into in better detail, I'll be honest. Yeah, Darren, that, that's, can, you, can we go back? I'm trying to visualise that map. I'm, I'm sort of got a, got a field picture now. Can, can you go back to the one with the, 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 the farm map again? Right. Um, I'm finding it difficult to accept why we have to build in that particular location and I'm wondering with the agent if, if we could go back to see if there is a more suitable site not beside the chicken houses if they have additional farmyards because I'm having difficulties with this you know I can understand and there's a business he hasn't presented a business need why it has to be so close to the chicken houses I understand why it has to be far away from the chicken houses and and I do use that road and occasionally you get a bit of a whiff off them, all right. Uh, um, but so I wouldn't want to live there myself. So I can understand why they don't want to live there. But I, I, I'm not sure why they have to be that close to it as well. Uh, you know, it's sort of they, they've gone to the, they've, they've drawn a line and said, right, we'll put it on the edge of the edge of that line for the 150. But is there any other sites? Uh, the same members today really is, is to assess the application. Uh, if you want, we can look at alternatives with with the applicant, and if there's a willingness, I'm sure with that parcel of land, uh, if there's a willingness there on behalf of the applicant, I'm sure we could find somewhere. Yeah. Well, then I, I propose. I think that's the safest thing we can do is we propose that we go back, and as you say, it seems to work easier whenever we've had a look at it. That, that, that maybe it might be an easier way to talk to them this, this the second time round. So that would be my proposal. Okay. It's John. Aaron. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks to Darren for explaining that piece of it. Uh, I've been inclined to agree with uh, Councillor McClarty. Uh, as we said on many occasions here, it's not in our interest to, to refuse applications and turn people down, especially a young fellow coming back home that wants to carry on on the farm uh, when, when his dad maybe is at a certain time. That he wants it maybe take it easier and and we, we need to keep this agriculture going as best we can so i i would be second uh, council mcclarty's proposal that our officers go back and uh, liaise with uh, the agent and the applicant to see where we can uh, get a, a proper uh, site that is suitable for all we certainly don't want it beside the hen houses <laughs> you wouldn't want to live there yourself so uh, that that's to be that's to be very much understood. So I'm happy to second that. Okay, thank thanks, you. sir. Okay, members, I'm not seeing any other indication. So we all agreed in that uh, course of action. All right. Okay, members. So application three, there's LA 10, 2022, 867. Uh, members have uh, gone against the recommendation to refuse and have deferred the application. Um, and uh, I think it was delegated back to officers. Um, yes, so we will look at that within the scheme of delegation and look at alternative sites as well. Okay. Thanks, members. Okay. okay. Item seven then. Just to note the schedule of planning decisions issued. And while we have quite a few there, I, I have asked Darren then that in future we would bring, or, or Paul actually it was, uh, that we would bring. Um, the previous two months uh, each time. So it gives us a little bit of a benchmark as to see because sometimes this is a two week period uh, and, you know, a substantial amount of uh, applications processed, but you don't really appreciate that if you don't appreciate what has come before you. So, Paul. 
Yes, I suppose, members, just to give you an idea, uh, I think there are 75 applications issued within two weeks there, um, which is quite a lot of work, uh, again, from from officers and members uh, through the committee, heavy agendas. Um, just giving you the comparison for November, there was 140 decisions issued for the entire month, and then October for the entire month was 91 decisions. So 75 is, is, is quite significant for a two-week period. Thanks, Chair. Okay, lovely. Can I have proposed and seconded Paul and Josephine to note? All agreed? Okay, to note the report on planning enforcement, and that's paper D. And unless there's anything specific, Paul? Yeah, nothing specific in this chair, just the details within the report. And again, it's just reflective of a two week period because um, the existing portal had locked down then um, for a data transfer. Okay. Can we have a proposal and second there? Tommy and Earl. All agreed. Moving to nine to consider reporting a Department for Infrastructure consultation on validation checklist. We heard a little about this at the uh, committee meeting the other night. So well, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, and this is just a, a consultation, members, which we would have been aware was coming from our own work on the validation checklist. Um, so this is a, a matter for decision for members. It's a reply to the DFA consultation now on uh, making the validation checklist a, a statutory requirement in legislation. Um, so the Department of Infrastructure, is, they've, they've consulted uh, with the Council on the 7th of November. Uh, in relation to the introduction of the, the validation checklist as a statutory requirement. Um, the, the consultation also seeks the views on the dispute mechanism, uh, where an applicant does not agree with the planning authority's decision not to validate an application, uh, where it considers uh, further information is needed uh, to make that complete. So the closing date for the receipt of comments is the 6th of January, members. Uh, draft responses uh, attached as Appendix 1. So. If members are content with um, with the comments in Appendix 1, then we'll submit those to DFI. Um, if there are any additions or additional comments, we can we can put those within the, the, the draft reply. So the purpose of the consultation uh, is to seek, obviously, the Council's views on the proposal. Um, and again, members, we, we've, we've had this discussion with our own validation checklist, and it's really to address the poor quality applications and complete applications that's entered in the planning system. Um, the Council and the Planning Committee has, has agreed in principle to introduce our own validation checklist. Uh, they reflect our own circumstances. Um, that was unanimously approved by the Planning Committee. So the principle of this is all agreed members. Um, and, and, and the response in, in Appendix 1 reflects that. Um, obviously, the checklist is going to improve the quality of applications and, and the submissions. Um, hopefully, allow for uh, greater speed uh, in making decisions then, uh, particularly those applications that are more complex and greater economic, environmental and social significance. Um, it is acknowledged, we, we all acknowledge that there may be site-specific instances when a particular survey is not required um, and, and planning agents uh, are encouraged to discuss any queries with, with officers and, and we have relayed that to uh, agents in a workshop uh, on the validation checklist in the portal, uh, and agents are, are content with that. In relation to the disputes, um, officers would be uh, of the view that uh, we sort of constructive and genuine discussions uh, during, during the pre-application process, the majority of disputes will be resolved. So we wouldn't think there should be too many coming forward. Um, officers, I suppose, would put forward uh, support for the uh, um, the, the dispute mechanism, uh, it's important that the public have an opportunity to dispute that. Um, and we've set out the details um, of the preferable approach from officers, and that relates to the system that's currently in, uh, in, in England. Um, and that's where um, the applicant would serve a notice on the planning authority, uh, saying that the additional information which has been requested is unreasonable, um, and they would want that requirement to be waived. Um, the plan authority then would have the opportunity to consider that and notify the applicant that it either agrees 
um, and that information is no longer required, and that will be called a validation notice, or one saying that the information is uh, still required, and that would be a non-validation notice. And um, rather than having that separate dispute mechanism, uh, the dispute then would be uh, form part of a non-determination appeal. Um, so essentially you wouldn't have uh, what would be a separate dispute mechanism on the validation process. Then enter a, an application, uh, progress an application and potentially have a, a, a sort of uh, an appeal at the end as well if there was a refusal. So it's trying to streamline that process from start to finish um, if, if, it, uh, if, if we favoured the approach in England. So members, um, let's say the principle of this is agreed. Um, it's uh, comments really in terms of the dispute mechanism and, and which uh, which which option members would favour. Um, and officers, I think, would favour the, the English version uh, just in terms of streamlining the approach. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Members, you've heard the uh, recommendation just as the reply in the consultation, the more streamlined vote done at the end. Do I take it that as we have nobody indicating that we're in agreement? Er? Thanks, Earl. Tommy? And the proposal. Okay. Are we all agreed, members? Okay. Thank you. Moving on to item number 10, uh, and that's paper F. Paul, that yourself again? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, this is a report, members. Um, it's a report on solastalgia um, and the implications within planning decision making. Um, so what is only a, a, a report for information members, um, just going through the detail here, uh, it's important that you understand this. At the Regeneration and Community uh, Committee meeting in July 22, uh, members did resolve that officers would investigate uh, the potential uh, for, for the Council to give consideration uh, in relation to plan and decision making, an approach that was recently introduced by Monaghan County Council. Um, which considers the impacts on local communities of the damage to their local environment through mining operations. Um, officers within the planning department uh, liaise with Monaghan County Council. Uh, they understand uh, that issue and, and what it involved in the context of it. And we also carried out our own research um, to help inform the paper and, and the advice uh, that we're outlining the members. Um, the issue is considered, um, it's known as solastalgia. Um, I suppose this report uh, considers uh, the implications for planning decision making. So in terms of what solastalgia is, members, it's an emerging uh, form of depression or distress uh, caused by environmental change, uh, such as climate change, natural disasters, extreme weather conditions, or other negative or upsetting alterations to one's uh, surroundings or homes. Um, this condition uh, it brings with it a profound, often long-lasting disruption to a person's sense of identity, belonging, uh, and security relating to where they live. Um, and the concept uh, of this is relatively new um, and was developed to better explain the particular anxiety, despair, and trauma experienced by those um, homeowners uh, and lands uh, that are affected by these type of uh, events um, and communities. Um, which are subject to, I suppose, unwanted and, and adverse or unforeseen environmental changes. So in terms of planning decision-making process, members, uh, solastalgia um, is considered to be a human health issue uh, and impacts on human health are material considerations uh, and are matters which, if raised um, by a member of the public during the course of a particular application, would need to be considered and balanced in that decision um, by any decision-maker. There are no regional plan and policy statements or, or draft policies within our own for man and Oma development plan, um, draft plan strategy on solastalgia itself. Uh, plan and policy normally covers topic areas such as housing and economy and environment. Um, but each, each policy will contain a number of criteria, um, which an applicant will have to comply with. 
uh, and that you know, relates to visual amenity, character, noise, or human health. And in the context of the Fermanagh Omer Area Plan, we have some policies where human health is listed as a, as a specific criteria, and it's within a, the focus number of policies where it might might occur. That's minerals development, uh, fracking, uh, renewable and low uh, carbon energy generation, and waste management facilities. Suppose members, in terms of, of moving forward, then um, you know planning professionals uh, and the courts would generally accept the planning policy cannot cover every eventuality. Um, and as outlined in paragraph 2.3, impacts on human health are material considerations and matters uh, that would need to be considered uh, by the decision maker. Um, so even if human health isn't listed within the policy as a specific criteria, it's still something that we'd have to set our minds to if it was raised in a particular application. Do you think it is a responsibility of the member of the public who considers that they have an impact on their own human health to raise us in the process? Um, if that's relevant for any particular scheme. And in considering human health impacts, it's acknowledged um, that ourselves we won't be experts in these matters and we may have to consult with an expert. Um, but it's important that these matters are balanced um, within the overall decision making process. Thanks, Chair. Just for noting. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Tommy. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. And thanks, Paul, for that. But I just have one query. Uh, Normally, if we're uh, dealing with applications, it's if there's a health issue, it's 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 a medical condition that's reported to us, and that's either significant or not within our thought process of adjudicating on the application. Uh, in this case, uh, to me, I'd be inclined to think that once, if we made a decision in the planning committee and it went ahead, that the solastalgia would arise post the granting of a, a planning application. When in our process would we be made aware that solastalgia is, is a condition out there? I'm inclined to think that that would come after a planning application has been granted. So there's no, is there a mechanism that we could consider this in anticipation? Or is it possible that it could be used as, in anticipation of a planning application to, to possibly uh, stall a planning application going through? Or, or you know... Can, can, could somebody apply to say that if this planned application was granted, I may possibly suffer from solastalgia? You know, it's the mechanism on when it would be notified and how it impacts on our, our decision making. Just, uh, Paul, I'm kind of lost okay. for a moment. Yeah, uh, and that's a good question, Councillor McGuire. I suppose uh, the issue uh, um, may only uh, be, be raised after the development occurs, uh, but at that time, the development, uh, I suppose, would permission would be granted. So there'd be no opportunity for us to revisit the decision. I think if the members of the public um, are aware that there's an application and potentially that these issues are going to arise and they have a fear of these issues, that they would raise it during the application process. And then we would consider that and balance that in our decision making. Sorry, Chair, just if I could come back on that point, but uh, normally, when we're dealing with an application with a medical condition uh, that's relevant to the application, we get uh, medical information, confidential information, usually from a, a medical practitioner that allows us to adjudicate that decision. But to get a recommendation that I may potentially have solastalgia after, uh, it's going to be very difficult to manage that on a, in a practical way. So, uh, again... We will wait in anticipation of the first case, Mr. Moore. Sure. Okay. Josephine. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Paul, for your report. Uh, this is really interesting. I must confess that I wasn't familiar at all with the term solastalgia, but for me, it makes perfect sense because when you consider um, our homes mean everything to us, you know, where we live, uh, the surroundings uh, that we live in uh, impacts very considerably on our sense of mental health and well-being. And um, if we're in a situation where that is threatened, uh, then it can evoke very um, deep emotions uh, uh, within ourselves, uh, which can lead to anxiety and depression and other adverse psychological uh, symptoms. I think we have seen evidence uh, uh, of, of this 
um, you know, in, in discu discussions we have had on various planning applications where uh, um, we have seen people object very vehemently uh, to planning applications which they feel will impact on the quality uh, of their uh, uh, living amenity and so on. We've seen it in respect of applications for wind turbines uh, where residents are concerned regarding noise and shadow flicker. We've seen it in respect of uh, application sites close to farmyards and he uh, hen houses and so on, where residents are concerned about odours and, and insects and so on. Um, I think it is, it is a very progressive development because I do think that as planners, we need to be very, very sensitive uh, to the, uh, the needs of people who live close to application sites. And certainly the areas that, ha that have been highlighted here, minerals development, fracking, renewable and low carbon energy generation or wind turbines or whatever, and waste management facilities, I think it's very relevant and, and I think it's very progressive and I would certainly uh, support this. I agree with Councillor Maguire that it might be difficult for us to quantify it. And this report states that we have to, we have to consider it in relation to other material considerations. So it isn't going to be easy, but I think it's right that we should consider these things and give them appropriate weighting. Okay. So I'm happy to uh, note the correspondence, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Josephine. Barry? Earl County Tyrone, and he, he was a shadow of his old self, and I was chatting to him, and he put it down to his health decline. He put it down to living close to a large wind turbine where there was shadow flicker, you know, and he was very convinced, you know, whether that was right or whether it was wrong clinically or medically, I don't know. But I came away from that conversation thinking he's a shadow of his old self and he is attributing it to that issue. So just, just to, to, to recount that anecdote, Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mary? Um, yeah, thanks, Chair. And interesting indeed. In, in similar vein, but Barry's in there, and then a, a report that's coming up later, we could use this term. But I, my question is, because like Josephine, and, and I am not a doctor like Josephine, is it an, a recognised medical term? Which is something I've never heard of. Um, that's my question, just to Paul if he knows. I'm looking and Googling away here, and I can see what I'm getting up on Google, but is it an official medical condition? Thanks, uh, Councillor Gardy. I, I am not sure, Councillor Gardy. I would need to find that out for you and come back uh, whether it's actually a, 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 a designated medical condition. Well, well, on the back of that, I think that is good, Paul, if you do through the chair find that out because whereas I certainly can relate and have many people that um, could be classified as that and as Barry has referred to his um, client that he referred to, um, if it's not a genuine medical, then we have to be very careful on how, how it's administered within, you know, our council or planning department. But it could be abuse, is what I'm saying. But I certainly can see how issues with planning and developments can, they say it's an emerging form of depression or distress caused by environmental change. And that certainly is, but just didn't know if it's an official medical term. We would need to know that. Um, just if we were using it, because if it wasn't an official medical term, we would just have to say that the people are distressed by the environmental change of the wind turbine, for example, as opposed to putting this name on it, if it wasn't a, a proper term. That would be my um, concern, Chair. Okay, thanks, Mary. Are you willing to second a noting? Certainly, yeah. Okay, thank you. And Paul? Chair, I agree with what Josephine was saying there. And uh, that, I mean, an application coming here to this council, I think a couple of years ago, and the lady had a medical reason for objecting to it. She was allergic to birds. And in fact, that woman had to sell the house and move away. She still got that bad. She had to sell the house and move out of the area. So, yeah. Slightly different there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. There's always reasons there. Okay, members, are we all agreed?
Yep. Okay, moving along to item number 11 and to consider a report on revised application to agent protocol, a good practice guide. Paul. Well, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, and members, this is a, a report on a revised applicant agent protocol, uh, the good practice guide for processing applications. Um, and it has arisen uh, because of the introduction of our validation checklist. Um, so the Council has uh, developed that validation checklist as part of our ongoing work in relation to planning performance and improvement just at the local level. Um, and again, it was uh, that checklist was unanimously agreed by the, by the planning committee. We have had a training event with agents uh, just to outline the changes and the requirements and discuss any concerns that they have. And that took place on the 28th of November. And it was agreed then that you know we would take forward the validation checklist and would commence on the 3rd of January. Uh, and a revision to the, the committee protocol uh, was presented to PNR uh, last night. So members, um, as the information and surveys are now required to be submitted in accordance with the validation checklist, uh, then the applicant agent protocol good practice guide, um, uh, that only promoted the front loading of application. Um, we've reviewed that and updated that, uh, in particular the time frames and the processes and the rules and responsibilities. Um, the guide will provide advice and guidance to applicants and agents uh, involved in the planning making process and how to deliver an efficient development management system. That's making best use of our limited resources. Um, the guide, as I say, now focuses uh, on how best to actively manage uh, the progress of applications through the development management system. Uh, it identifies the roles and responsibilities of, of council staff, officers, um, applicants and agents at each stage in the process, um, just in order to try and deliver uh, good quality planning applications in an efficient, manager, uh, efficient manner and at the least cost. Um, so, uh, members, we will keep that on the review um, just to make sure that it meets our local needs uh, and any other improvement projects that we're taking forward. Um, and we will review that again, uh, potentially in the new year when the, pl the new planning portal has better done uh, and fall in any direction from DFI and or LDP. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Aaron? Thank you again, Chair, and thanks to you, Paul, for the report. Uh, very detailed there, Paul, we uh, put that over. I'm happy to go to the recommendation and propose the officer's recommendation. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Anthony? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'd be happy enough to second it. I was just wondering what was that at the training event that was held on the 28th? Was, was there many at it? Did many agents uh, go to it? I was just wondering. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Councillor. It was actually one of our better events, um, better attended events. Uh, there was over 40 agents um, at the event. Um, good engagement from the agents as well. Good questioning. Um, I'm very content with the validation checklist as well. They understand the quality of the application, so uh, as important. Okay. All right. To commend Paul for that report and for that exercise. Um, I think some of us will have informally met groups of agents, you know, in the past, you know, sometimes they talk about general concerns, you know, and that was in the past for me, but just to seek uh, clarity from Paul, is there is there a structured forum for agents in OMA or in Fermanagh or in the one council area? You know, is it organised and do they notify their members or is it all done on a one-to-one -one basis, you know, in the notification for such an event? Firstly, uh, Councillor Michael Duff, I'd, I'd just like to say it, it was thanks to all the officers and the staff of uh, planning, um, not necessarily myself. Um, so we have our own planning agent database um, and we use that and we update that regularly. Um, quite a significant number of agents, not just local agents, but any agent that submits applications uh, to us as a council. Um, and they would have been all invited and they are all invited to our workshops or any correspondence or updates that we need to send out, we send it to our agent database. And do you receive correspondence sometimes from a, a forum for agents? 
No, I'm not aware of the agents having a forum. If they do, we don't receive any feedback from a forum, but we receive plenty of feedback from agents. Um, I've re received that specifically to myself and through generally to the plan and mailbox as well. Thank you. Okay, members, we have a proposed by Earl, second by Anthony. Are we all agreed? Okay, moving on to 12, to note the report on revision to the scheme of delegation. Yeah, thanks, Chair um, and members. Um, we'll take a wee bit of time just to go through this because it's a revision to the scheme of delegation. It's important that you understand it um, when you're making your decision. So the purpose of the report um, is really to seek members' agreement to revise the council scheme of delegation, and um, that's to allow you applications which NA Water have objected to, and the officer's recommendation is to approve to remain delegated the officers. Um, Members will be aware some of those applications have come before the committee previously. On contentious applications, we know objections, um, fairly uh, fairly minor, uh, and members have agreed with officers' recommendation. So this forms part of the Council's ongoing work in relation to planning, performance and improvement, um, and this amendment will also help to streamline the process. So we don't have to take it under the committee for decision, we can progress the decision. So the revised uh, scheme of delegation set out in Appendix 1. So under Section 31 of the, the, the Planning Act members, the, the Council uh, must prepare a scheme of delegation uh, which sets out those local planning applications, um, applications for consent and approvals, which can be determined uh, by a person appointed by the Council instead of the Council itself. Um, the co Council's current scheme of delegation uh, for the determination of applications uh, was agreed or revised on the 7th of July 2022 uh, and became effective from the 22nd of July. And it allows certain types of applications to be determined, uh, as I say, by a, a person appointed by the council. Um, and applications which are not delegated to those officers uh, must be determined by the planning committee. So applications attracting material objections from statutory consultees um, where the officer's recommendation uh, is to approve are not delegated at present uh, and must be determined by the planning committee. Um, and as I said, members, um, they will be aware uh, that NA Water has objected to a number of applications. There's a number still in the system um, that we're currently progressing um, and, and the issues are still there. Uh, whilst there is capacity at the receiving wastewater treatment works, um, there is insufficient, uh, insufficient network capacity within the public infrastructure for new development to connect into, um, to get into uh, the NA water network, uh, and NA water have been recommending refusal for those applications. So it is a material consideration, members. Um, however, there is capacity at the receiving wastewater treatment works. And NA Water's objection relates solely to the capacity of the pipes and the network transfer and the waste to the wastewater treatment works. Um, it's reasonable on those occasions um, they attach a condition to the planning permission. Um, and the condition will allow the permission um, or the development uh, that's granted um, for work to commence. Um, whilst the developer negotiates and agrees a connection with NA Water, and that can be done outside the planning process. So members, you'll be familiar with the condition we had presented it previously in an application uh, set out in paragraph 2.6 there. Uh, I'm not going to read it out in detail, um, but it basically um, restricts development until, until there's that agreement. So in order to streamline the processing of applications, uh, officers are requesting that the current scheme of delegation then is amended. Uh, they allow applications which attract uh, objections from NA Water on this specific issue only um, to remain delegated to the officers within the scheme of delegation, as I say, rather than uh, bringing those back in the committee. I suppose it, it is also suggested when we are amending the scheme of delegation, uh, we revise, uh, revise a change uh, from material objections to significant objections as well, um, with a definition of the meaning of sig significant included. Um, and again, this will allow more applications to be crest uh, under the scheme of delegation. And again, the wording um, I said out there uh, within the paragraphs 2.8 and 2.9 members. So I say it's um, it's an attempt to uh, streamline the process um, and, and, and take those decisions on their delegated authority. 
Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Paul. That gives us a better understanding there. Can I get a proposal and seconder? Proposed by Tommy, seconded by Paul. All agreed. Okay, members, thank you. We're going to move on to correspondence. We have two items of correspondence there. Uh, to note, uh, correspondence from the Department of Infrastructure. And does anybody want to comment on them? Or uh, if not, can I have a proposal and seconder to note? Josephine, thank you. Thank you. And Paul, all agreed? Thank you, members. And we're going into confidential matters or any other uh, relevant or urgent business. I haven't been notified of any, so I'm taking it as not. Okay, we're going to go to confidential matters now. And Proposed by Earl, seconded by uh, Paul, and all agreed. Thank you. And if we.
Well, thank you, Chair. So uh, while in confidential business, uh, members uh, dealt with matters arising from the, the meeting of the 19th of October and there were no matters arising and also considered a report on a planning appeal decision and uh, agreed with the recommendations presented. OK, can I propose and seconder, Josephine and. I seen your hand moving, John, so you're seconding, are you? Uh, that's good. Uh, thank you. And uh, just before we wrap members uh, with that cooperation there, can I just, uh, uh, yeah. Did? Yes, we're both noted. You just missed that one, Josephine, that's all right. Um, and while we're finishing up, I just want to wish everybody a very happy and uh, relaxing Christmas and New Year break. And particularly to all of the to the officers uh, uh, that have worked uh, here, even the IT officer who works behind the scenes, uh, really uh, behind the scenes uh, on all of our meetings to make sure it all uh, works well. Of course, also to yourselves, members, and to um, all of the applicants and the agents and, and people that we interact throughout the year with on our planning uh, quest to try and deliver good decisions for our citizens. So uh, hopefully we'll see everybody back uh, happy and healthy in the new year. So thank you all very much.